Welcome back to Eugene, and here come the Bruins. UCLA running into a cauldron of noise on the road for the second time this season. Maybe not a lot of success against number one teams in the AP as Oregon is tonight, but the Bruins can draw on this game earlier this season against Texas. The Horns were ranked seventh. Jonathan Franklin went for 118 yards in a score, and Kevin Prince, who will not play tonight, sealed the deal with the touchdown run. UCLA took advantage of four Texas turnovers, and they won it 34-12. to Obviously, Oregon would like to avoid that fate, and head coach Chip Kelly's with Jen Brown. Coach, Oregon is ranked number one in the AP polls for the first time in school history. What's the vibe of the team right now, right before We're kickoff? Fired up. How can you be fired up with this atmosphere? It's awesome. Uh, how do you expect your team to handle the pressures moving forward, being the number one team in the country? We say the same thing before we take the field in every game. Pressure is what you feel when you don't know what you're doing, and we don't feel pressure because we know what we're doing. All right. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Jeff. Reese? Well, you bet they do, and so too does Rick Neuheisel in his third season back at his alma mater as UCLA head coach, the MVP of the 1984 Rose Bowl, trying to rebuild a Bruin program and restock it with talent. And thus far, three games under 500 and 3-3, three and 1-2 three, and two in the conference this year. Bruins won the toss and rather than deferring, wanted to make sure that high-powered Oregon offense did not get on the field. Part of the game plan for Neuheisel, eat the clock, shorten the game, and try to limit the number of plays the Ducks can get off. Oregon set to kick off. UCLA set to receive. And we are underway from Autzen. It is Damian Thigpen who will take it in the end zone. Big Pan will be knocked down at about the 21-yard line, and the Bruins will put it in play first behind Richard Brijo, a highly touted quarterback coming out of high school, Jess. Rick Neuheisel told us that he loves Brijo's grit, and he says he's a winner. He said this environment tonight is not too big for his young quarterback. We're going to find out real quick. It won't be too big as long as that offensive line gives him time. That's the key to this whole football game, the O-line of UCLA. UCLA with a new pistol attack this season. Rio comes out throwing. First pass is complete. It's been a problem for UCLA completing passes, so they're off to a good start. How about the impact players? Running back Jonathan Franklin is the best player on offense for the Bruins. He's the first guy since Maurice Jones drew to have three consecutive games of over 100 yards rushing. Uh, these receivers have to work to help out their quarterback. Taylor Embry, he has 93 career receptions. Got to work hard tonight. And the Ducks' defense is anchored by Casey Matthews of the great football Matthews family. He's gained six turnovers this season. That is the most in the nation. Rio's first pass of the night complete to Embry, and he's UCLA with a second and one. Franklin. And Franklin flags flying all over the place. And Franklin got plenty for the first down. It's like a face mask. It'll probably go against the Ducks. Jane Strickers talking it over, leading this Pac-10 crew tonight. UCLA with two solid offensive players. Personal foul, face mask on the defense. 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Jesse, right off the bat, you see an offensive line that has set up and did a nice job of allowing the pistol to have success on the ground early. Now, I think this is a team that feels like they can run north-south against this Oregon defense that does a lot of east-west running. Look there like that was Spencer Paysinger, the outside linebacker on the face mask. It was indeed Paysinger, a senior from Los Angeles. Game very meaningful to all of the Southern California kids, and there are several of them on the Oregon roster. Franklin has it again. Spacinger, Spacinger has him as he crosses the 45. As we prepared for this football game, there, there's a, an assumption it felt like on many fans and people around the country's part that UCLA, uh, they got whacked by Cal. That, that they weren't a challenge for this Oregon team. And that's just a misconception. I mean, this team has the ability, a, a dangerous ability to win on the road. A very young team, Craig, uh, rebuilding on the offensive line. They lost some guys they anticipated having this year. Only one starter returning on the defensive front seven. 
Riho completed his first, and he completes his second. Christian Ramirez has a first down inside the Duck 35. Really nice job of play calling by offensive coordinator Norm Chow, getting his young quarterback easy completions early to get a confidence here in a hostile environment. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm thinking Norm Chow. I'm thinking here's a guy now that's, that's had to change his style to the pistol. You know Norm Chow with a history of great quarterbacks throughout his life. He's figured out how to adapt his style, his play calling to his quarterbacks. Chow at USC for a number of years, liner. Austin Palmer, BYU, and that great legacy of quarterbacks there. On the ground, Franklin plowing his way. And for those of you who might not be as familiar with Jonathan Franklin, he has really thrived in this new offensive attack. He's 15th in the country, averaging about 113 yards per game. He's a little guy, only 5'10", a buck 98, but he's got a lot of power behind those legs. He's gone off a couple times in some big games this year against some pretty good defense strike. When UCLA wins, he rushes for 164 a game. When they lose, he only goes for 62 a game. Second down and six after the Franklin four-yard carry. Jonathan has it again. Not a loss to half yard, and as you alluded to, Craig, Franklin has been a great indicator of UCLA's success this season in the three victories that the Bruins have, two of them against ranked opponents in Texas and Houston. He's averaging 164 yards per game in the three losses, a little under 63. Third down will be the critical down tonight for the Bruins. Rick Neuheisel told us the goal is 50%. When they've won three games this year, they've been at 50% on third down. Three losses, they've been just at 19%. You see the number not good on third down overall among the worst in the country. Brijo firing, got a man, but it's intercepted. Picked off by John Boyette. That is Oregon's 23rd takeaway this season that leads the nation. I think what you're going to see here is a safety playing back deep, Richard Brijo. Not a lot of experience, just does not anticipate, just does not anticipate on the backside that safety that's going to come up and the ball just took too long to get there. Yeah, I don't mind the decision so much by Richard Brijo as I do the throw. This needs to be a hard straight ball. Remember, Oregon comes into this game with 22 takeaways. That's their 23rd. That's the most in the country. So the defense stopping the UCLA drive. Darren Thomas will throw. He's got his man as tight end, David Paulson. Paulson across the 30, up close to the 35. A 24-yard pickup. Thomas operating this frenetically paced duck offense. Thomas going to throw it again. He's got Jeff Mayo in the Bruin territory. And down to the 45-yard line. You feel the energy of the crowd. They expect the tempo their offense is giving them. It is one of the fastest. It's probably the fastest offense in the country. UCLA has not seen anything like this yet defensively. They have to get lined up. They have to get in their gaps or they will get burned. Option. Josh Huff. Huff, who plays a little bit of receiver, a little bit of running back. Not much there against the Bruin D. How about the play calling by Chip Kelly early in this game? Getting Darren Thomas involved, getting him comfortable. A couple play action looks, wide open receivers over the middle of the field. What's interesting about this offense, Chip Kelly might make a call, and you're thinking, okay, it's looking like it's a zone read, and all of a sudden they pull up, and they'll throw the ball deep because the safeties have come up to support run. You really can't pinpoint exactly what they're trying to do. Another pass, another completion is D.J. Davis. Davis will be knocked out of bounds short of the first down. It'll bring up a third down for the Ducks. UCLA defensive coordinator Chuck Bolo told his team this week, one play and clear. Play, run back to the ball, forget it, because another one's coming right away. You see the play cards that Oregon holds up? <laughs> Scott Van Pelt. VP. What do you think the signal is for VP? There's old Reese, RD. I actually had a conference with Darren Thomas. I know what my plays mean. All right. 
Thomas looking for that bubble screen and Mayo UCLA played that perfectly. Excellent job by the linebacker Sean Westgate. Tony Dye was there as well and a good stand for the Bruin defense. Uh, you, you say stand but you know what the way this offense is and where they are right now they're going to go for it. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. And so that's why you got to reload because that's the mindset of a football defense you know but get back on the ball they're going. Fourth down and six. Ducks are 7 for 11 on fourth down this season. Thomas. Wide open is LaMichael James. First down and more. James inside the 20. Touchdown saving tackle by Raheem Moore. How about the composure on this play by sophomore Darren Thomas? It's a big fourth down. He's not going to freak out when his first and second reads aren't open. Doesn't run with him. That instead comes back to his fourth read. It's the running back on the swing. James has it again. That will be a run, a backward pass. Either way, it's going forward now as Michael James pushes it closer to the Bruin goal line. Paulson getting a good block in front of him. Tempo, tempo, tempo. Michael has it. James, touchdown! The motto is fast, hard, finish. Chip Kelly's Ducks did all three. Eight plays, 90 yards, and four seconds less than two minutes capped off by the James touchdown run. We think, I believe the referee Jay Stricker has just said they're going to have a look at it to see if LaMichael got into the end zone. One thing we've seen all season with the fast-paced offense is when they get to the huddle or to the line without a huddle, many of them have mistakes. That doesn't happen with Oregon. They're able to get up there, snap it quick before the defense is ever set. Yeah, he crosses. Oh, that's easily that's a touchdown. touchdown. Yeah, Easy. That won't be long. But you know what I'm saying? How many times have we seen that? Fast pace, fast pace, fumble exchange, something goes wrong. And you can't overstate the stress that this style of offense puts on a defense, whether it's just getting lined up properly, playing fundamentally sound football, running sideline to sideline, tackling in space, and then getting back to focus again. It's just it's too much. I'll ask you guys a question, just even from a... After further review, the play on the field is confirmed. Play results on a touchdown. The pace of this football team and their offense is so different. It feels different in an announced group. I mean, you can't say that about any of the other teams we've covered. You don't see quite as much. You see, you'll see it some, and not quite as much looking to the sidelines for checks. A lot of times, they just go ahead and run the play and, and keep it at the tempo. They want to wear down the other team. That's how many of the offensive guys we talked to this week said that they really thrive when they start hearing opposing defensive linemen start to say that uh, they might lose pregame meal if they run another one at this pace. Rob Beard on for the extra point. And he puts it through. Now 34 for 34. And Richard Brijo had the Bruins on the move until he threw the interception. And then the Ducks came right back behind their Heisman candidate, Michael James. Ducks on the board in the first quarter and up 7-0. Back in Austin Stadium, Ducks on the board quickly, and that is their custom 7-0. So over nine minutes to go in the first quarter. Well, Michael James with his 10th rushing touchdown of the year. Oregon doesn't take long. Another touchdown drive of less than three minutes. It is Damian Thigpen returning the kickoff. Thigpen had to fight for every yard, and he gets just across the 20-yard line. Richard Brijo come out for his second series. He's making his second start tonight. Four-star quarterback coming out of high school. He needs to be very careful now. Young, inexperienced quarterback playing on the road in a hostile environment. Now you're down to the best scoring offense in the country. It's easy to want to throw a touchdown pass each and every throw. He's got to be careful, play within himself.
Franklin has it on the option look. This is, this is a lot like the, the old school beer, is it not, with the pistol? It is. It really is, and it's downhill. That's what the runners like about it is that they're going downhill. Their first steps are coming towards the line of scrimmage. That offensive line likes it because it usually gets by them quick. And that O-line averages 317 pounds. They really outweigh Oregon up front defensively. That's going to be their advantage tonight in this football game, in the trenches. Early on when Stanford came in here, Stanford had some success, not only with Andrew Luck throwing, but also running the football. UCLA would like to emulate that. Franklin again. Flag coming in from way in the secondary. Franklin got up close to the 30-yard line. He'll be a couple of yards short of the first down. We'll see what the result of the penalty will be. Much trouble as the Bruins have had passing. The one thing they can't afford is first throwback. First foul, face mask on the defense. 15 yard penalty, automatic first down. They won't have to worry about it. Second face mask penalty on the Ducks in the first quarter. And a lot of times when you see these face masks, it's a result of a very shifty running back. Jonathan Franklin moving side to side, pausing someone on defense to reach out and grab mask instead of cloth. Missing tackle. Because he's only five foot ten. I mean, when you're reaching out at shoulder level, you're actually hitting him in the face. That's kind of another advantage you have of having a little back. Brio. Nifty run from Richard Brio gets just into Oregon territory to about the 49-yard line. That's not necessarily a strong suit, but it worked well. But he's not a bad fit for this pistol offense because he ran the spread offense in high school. Yeah, and you know what? They will have to run. He'll have to have success tonight. Brio must use his legs to add another element against this Oregon defense. So one of the successful things that UCLA did against Texas, and then Texas subsequently did against Nebraska, was run the quarterback. Even without Prince, Brio will have to make some plays with his feet tonight. They'll probably rely on Franklin to make more. It'll bring up a third down. Defensive coordinator Nick Aliotti for Oregon told us he was going to load the box in this game to try to prevent the run. You see there on that example, there's a safety about eight yards deep. They bring the short field corner. They got nine guys involved to try to get around the ball carrier, Franklin. Third down and one facing the Bruins, who would love to chew up the clock. Keep this ground game going and keep the Oregon offense off the field. There's a high snap. Rio hit and knocked down behind the line of scrimmage. Terrell Turner in the backfield to make the play. The timing in this play seemed way off. When he puts the football out to extend it for the fake to Jonathan Franklin, it just took too long, Craig, and that allowed all those black helmets to get in the back. Yeah. You know what? Every time we see short yardage goal line, third and one, fourth and one, and not having a quarterback under the center, the ball snapped five yards deep, timing off. Defenses are just too quick off the edges. So the other guy that messed up that play was the defensive tackle, Brandon Bayer, who was back there and... Allowed Turner to take care of both guys. And the Bruins will punt it away. Here's Cliff Harris. Cliff Harris is the nation's leading punt returner, despite the fact he's not necessarily their leading guy. That's Kenyon Barner. Ducks have it for the second time. State-of-the-art training facilities here in Eugene at the University of Oregon as you get a little quick glimpse at the workout that Craig and Jesse will have a little bit later on, I think. We didn't get the we didn't get we the didn't, water whirlpool. Water water that, that, why didn't That's we give us that one? We'll, we'll take care of you if you guys continue to work hard. But Michael James, UCLA thought he had it, but Darren Thomas pulled it out. He had a good gain around left end. I've really been impressed with Darren Thomas so far this year on his decision-making, not only in the pass game, but in the run game as well. He keeps it when he's supposed to on zone read. Second down three. Ducks need three. They'll get that more. Thomas settling it beautifully into the hands of David Paulson. Best hands on the team, says Chip Kelly. 
came here and announced the spring game. Oregon trying to figure out, was it Nate Costa, Darren Thomas? Both were pretty equal. Chip Kelly, again, taking a quarterback, bringing him up to the level of play that he has. He's done it now several times with this program. Remine Austin coming in motion. Whistles going everywhere. The Bruins. Timeout. UCLA prior to snap. This almost feels like a tempo timeout that Ben Howland would call for the UCLA basketball team. Slow things down <laughs> if they can. I think that this look on the face of Chip Kelly would qualify as a look of amusement. After Rick Neuheisel's team called a timeout to try to get their defense in order against the quick-paced Oregon offense, Neuheisel less than happy. You know what Chip Kelly's saying right there? What's I, that? I got you right where I want you. Oregon players start talking about watching guys fake the cramps and so forth, and they know they have them. Timeouts potentially could serve to do that as well. You want to be right against this offense, Michael James. Knocked down by Reginald Stokes. I can I can assume now for a little bit what New Heisel was telling his defense. Play hard. Do your job and play hard. Don't worry about someone else. Another quick snap. Gap. James into the secondary and he's knocked down by Courtney Viney. This is a gap scheme offense. They try to get players out of position. There may not be a better running back in the country at finding the open lane than Michael James. We could show you the replay. <laughs> We'd show you how they turned back block and absolutely walled off UCLA's defense. Aaron Thomas. Plenty of time. Thomas throws another dart inside the 25. Catch there by mail. The second time tonight we've seen Darren Thomas get through three progressions on the same pass play. He is dialed in. Here's the problem and the, and the risk that you have if you dial up the blitz. If you lose gap responsibility, which is easy to do against this team here, you're burned immediately. Thomas turns the corner. Darren will have the first down, it appears, at about the 12-yard line. I, I, I really wish we could show you here. True freshman, Owe Odigazue, on the outside, his first time to see a zone read quarterback. And that time, he just got caught in no man's land. How'd I do with that? <laughs> okay. O Odigazue is a kid who's from a couple hours away from here in Portland. And... Uh, He's getting a baptism by the Ducks right now. James inside the 10. What's amazing to think about is that Oregon actually practices faster than this. I mean, th this game tempo is slow for them. They've got to wait on the chains to be moved. They've got to wait on officials to get the ball set. I mean, it really slows it down. Second down. Give for Michael James. Hit hard. He's driving for the end zone. He can't pick up a first down without scoring. Tony Dye was there. Bruins saying they have the football. And James is still on the carpet. Uh, and, and the forward progress of James while he was kind of going through the air. What happened to the football while he was being carried along the way? Well, obviously, uh, Anytime you have a player of the caliber full of Michael James down, what he means to the offense, it's it's a uh, reason for Oregon to hold its breath, but it's uh, multiplied by the fact that Kenyon Barner is not playing tonight. He was hurt in the Washington State game. Let's see if we can ascertain whether he fumbled the ball before he went down. The ball definitely comes out there at the end. Kind of gets spun around. He's got it in his right hand. Uh, no, that's down. not a fumble. That's that's down. He, he's yeah. down. He is down. But, but like you said, Reese, the big concern here is the Michael James who's getting up. That's a great sign for this offense. He can help off the field. You know, James, everybody who carries the ball as much as he does, obviously a very tough competitor. He had a, a knee injury in the fall that they feared would be something that would keep him out for a significant period of time. But... Well, Michael was back in a couple of days. He got to a great start tonight, 44 yards. And 
We'll that, get an update on him as soon as we can. Well, that means senior Remini Alston, number five. He's got to take over the slack. Remini Alston's in the game now. Here's the first and goal. Thomas is going to keep it. Thomas makes a tough shot at the one. Bruins flying around. And will be second and goal. And the thing that James does as a runner so well is when the gap is exposed on defense, he finds it. And 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 these other runners might might not be quite as good as him at that, but they're still dangerous because it's a spread out in offense. Tons of depth, Craig. Alston, touchdown, Oregon. Jesse has a testament to that depth. Remine Alston's been the third string running back for most of the season. That's, that's his third touchdown carry already this year. They get up early. They get up fast, believe me, because they've been blowing teams out. A lot of these backups and third stringers have seen a lot of action this year. Nate Costa, the backup quarterback. They have the automatic. If they see it, they'll just run it for two. And it looks as if Costa got it in. So as if Oregon needs another weapon to find a way to put an extra point on the board. They find it with a two-point conversion from Nate Costa. I think this falls under the category of what Chip Kelly lives by. Hard, fast, and finish. The touchdown, and then they go for two. He doesn't care. He's going to play his game. They got the numbers advantage. Costa takes advantage. Ducks by 15. Back in Austin Stadium, Oregon's had it twice, scored two touchdowns, and up 15-0 on UCLA in the first quarter. Ducks about to kick it away again. Well, Michael James, the star running back, is injured close to the goal line. Let's see if he is going to be available to return. The Bruins return the kickoff as Damian Thigpen. It can a little crease. He gets across the 30-yard line as we check in with John Saunders. Well, we're in the Sports Center right now, brought to you by Keystone Light in the MLS. The Red Bulls can clinch the Eastern Conference with a win tonight against the New England Revolution. 17th minute, Dane Richards makes it a 1-0 game. That game is over on ESPN2. And the Phillies are leading the Giants 3-2. Of course, the Giants looking to close out that series tonight. Race. All right, John, the Bruins need to put together a productive drive. They've moved the ball a little bit the first couple of times, but nothing to show for it yet as we check in with Jen Brown. Well, we saw Michael James come off the field. When they brought him over to the side, it looked like he was grabbing his left side just underneath his ribs. The trainers did a little bit of diagnostics test. They laid him down. Coach Kelly came over, said, you okay, you okay? Well, Michael said, I'm all right. So he's back on the sideline standing up. We'll see if he goes in the next time they're on offense. All right, Jen, and Chip's custom is to play it very close to the windbreaker when it comes to releasing injury information. Let's see if Michael gets back. Meanwhile, Brijo with a second and eight. Brijo completes the pass to his tight end, Joseph Fourier, the Notre Dame transfer. Puts it up close to the first down. Here we go with another third and short. See what they try to do at UCLA this time. But the last time, that the long snap, the timing way off. Franklin looks as if he'll have enough for the first down. So that was a big-time conversion there by UCLA. I know it's early. They're only down 15 nothing, But this pistol offense is not conducive to playing catch-up. This game starts getting out of hand early. This is not a great passing team. Well, it's a team that averages 232 yards a game on the ground. 23 points. And it, just throwing it down the field is not their cup of tea. Jesse, you were extraordinarily kind. They're the third worst passing offense in the country. Something the new Heisel and Norm Chow certainly want to work on to try to balance their attack. Franklin. Franklin into the secondary. He's close to another first down for UCLA. 
Well, for the third week in a row, the number one team this time takes the BCS standings, faces a critical road challenge. Number one in the BCS, Oklahoma, goes to Missouri Saturday night, 8 o'clock Eastern time on ABC. Blaine Gabbert and the Tigers have played extraordinarily well. DeMarco Murray, worthy of being in that Heisman talk, too. How about Missouri? Very quietly playing great defense. 20 sacks on the year. They've got defensive end Alvin Smith back. He was last year's Big 12 freshman of the year. Who have they played? Illinois and Texas A&M, and that's it, my friend. It was a first down. Derek Coleman's into the game for the Bruins, and the Bruins running right at the Ducks. Good pickup on first down by Coleman. Yeah, and here's a guy that had 185 on the ground against Washington State, three touchdowns. They've got good running backs here at UCLA. Tonight up front, they're doing good. It's just the, the little things that they've missed on the third down conversions, and you can't give it back to them. Oregon's going to score when they get the football. Well, Coleman's a guy who averages seven and a half yards per carry. That is just slightly ahead of Michael James, his 10th best in the country. Derek's still in there as the running back in the pistol offense. Coleman has it again. Coleman's got room. Plowing over Ducks. Eric Coleman running with authority. And Javis Lewis took the business end of that one. Oh, see that north-south mentality here by the Bruins. A little bit bigger back with Coleman. Punishing those Ducks in the secondary. <laughs> Quarter is coming to a close. You might remember Lewis is the guy who cold caught Chris Owusu in the Stanford game. He was on the worst end of that one. UCLA trying to stay in it down 15. start in Eugene, number one team in the land, according to the polls, the Oregon Ducks, second in the BCS. On top of UCLA, 15-0. Ducks have had it twice, scored twice, much to the delight of the Hello Yellow crowd. Crowd urged to wear yellow tonight in Austin Stadium. Reese Davis, Craig James, Jesse Palmer, and Jen Brown, glad to have you with us on Thursday night as the Bruins are on the move. Three consecutive runs of at least 10 yards for UCLA's Derek Coleman. And Coleman has it again, and he is plowing through ducks. Well, in the pistol offense, they don't telegraph where they're going to run the football because the back isn't offset. He can go right, left, or right up the middle. The defense, it's tough for them to make leverage calls. They can't slant their D-line right or left, try to get angles against the running game. And you saw the wham block on the right side. Once that tight end came inside, it gave more numbers to block to the left side than when the ball was snapped. They outnumbered them offensively. Getting noisy in the red zone. Bobbled snap, but Coleman saved it after Brijo couldn't handle it. Eric got down close to the first down. Here's UCLA once again down in the red zone. It is absolutely critical. We're able to come away with points here. They got very lucky on a bobbled snap. Just kind of falls in the hands of running back Coleman. He's able to fall forward. Still third short. You know what, Jesse? I've seen a couple of snaps now tonight that have been just up a little bit, taking the quarterback's rhythm away from where he wants to be. Bruins have struggled in the red zone, scoring only 74% of the time among the bottom 20 in the nation. Need the first down. Coleman got it inside the 15, first and 10, UCLA. Another example where the motion back comes across, gives them the numbers to the left side. And with Coleman and his size and power at 230 pounds, that's all they need for short yardage. Again, it's early. It's 15-0. But I'm saying UCLA needs a touchdown right here based on the fact that their defense has not proven they could have slowed down Oregon's offense at all. A lot of pressure early in this game for this young offense. Now, Brijo looks back to the sideline. There's still some time on the play clock. You'll never see the play clock get this deep when Oregon has it. <laughs> Bruins content to take their time. Franklin's back in. Franklin has it. He's getting inside the 10. And the 
UCLA Blue and offensive line is making their living right in the center of the Oregon defense right now. Absolutely. Now, in the game that we broke down against Texas, they did a nice job up front like they're doing tonight in their big blowout and rushing defeat against Cal. Cal's defensive line owned them. But Texas, like Oregon defensively, is built to stop spread offenses. They're finesse, and that's the advantage this tough UCLA running game has. Second and five. Bruins inside the Oregon 10. Franklin hesitates momentarily, and it'll bring up third down. Norm Trout's going to have to at some point get outside the tackle box and put the pressure on his quarterback and have confidence in Richard Grijo to make a play outside. Norm Chow is excellent at adding the wrinkle to the play. He could be setting them up for some play action, get Richard Grijo to the perimeter of the football field, run pass option here, but I still think this is four down territory. Oh, I agree with that 100%. Ten of the last 11 plays have been runs. Rio has hit three of his four passes. On third down, Chow looking for the right call. It'll be a run, and Franklin won't get there. So now you guys say four down territory. It's pretty substantial distance to game, but UCLA is going to send out their automatic place kicker, Ty Forbath, who's the Groza winner last year. Field goals will not be enough to beat Oregon here tonight. I guarantee you that. So here's what Rick's thinking. I can't afford not to get this thing and go down 21-0. I've got to get some points on the board psychologically for my football team. Maybe the distance that they have to go to for the fourth yeah. down. Pretty sizable chunk. So Forbath, who's hit 8 out of 10, puts his foot to it. There's not a guy in college football more automatic than him. Bruins on the board, 15-3. Ducks will get it back. Back here in Eugene, let's take a look at tonight's intelligent move brought to you by Mercedes-Benz. Well, it's been a very smart move by Chip Kelly to continue to do what he does. LaMichael James getting to the end zone. Darren Thomas reading and managing this offense. Remedy Alston coming in for that second score. It's only taken this Oregon Ducks offense 18 snaps to score 15 points. And it is never too early for Chip Kelly to try a fake extra point. So the Ducks have a 15-3 lead. UCLA scoring on Ty Forbath's 81st career field goal, just six short NCAA record. As you have a look at LaMichael James, who left on the last series with an injury, as Jen Brown reported, his hip and rib area. Old Chip Kelly was okay. We'll see if LaMichael returns. Josh Huff returning the kickoff for the Ducks. Freshman with great speed. His head spun around a little bit, too. I think they're going to get the Bruins for a face mask. I mean, Derek Coleman, who's done such a good job running the football in the UCLA offense, working on special teams. I've gotten a handful of the helmet. Personal foul, face mask on the defense. 15-yard penalty, first down. It's the third face mask penalty of the night, but the first two have been against Oregon. Bad enough to have to just kick off to this offense, but Whoa. how about that face mask, 15-yarder, and now all of a sudden the Ducks start their third drive from midfield. If you're UCLA, you have to at least match somewhat and score somewhat offensively, and you've got to neutralize the special teams. They cannot lose that phase. James is back in. Is he ever? Well, Michael James. I think they just aggravated him. Wow, watch the next level of yellow jerseys. The offensive line getting down to linebackers and safeties and blocking. They're already ready to snap. Thomas throwing complete. He's got Lavoisier 2 and A. One thing that's made Oregon so good this year is their productivity on first down. They've been averaging 6.5 yards per carry on that down. You see a UCLA defensive player down. It's David Carter. Now, let me explain. You're probably hearing some scattered boos. Now, Carter, and you never have any way of knowing this for sure, Carter appears to be in great distress. The reason the crowd reacts the way it does at times, it has been uh, a strategic move by some opponents this year, according to the Oregon coaches, that guys have faked injuries in order to, to slow them down. Carter, though, is the training staff out to have a look at the senior. We'll check on his condition when you come back. 
to see some of the faces from Oregon football history. The previous guy was Ahmad Rashad, named to the College Football Hall of Fame 2007. Derek Lavelle is Oregon's all-time leading rusher. And Oregon, while certainly some great stars in its history, trying to go 7-0 for just the third time in school history. The last time was 1933. Darren Thomas firing. Thomas is 9 for 9. It's another Oregon touchdown, and it's Josh Huff on the catch. Gentlemen, I don't think the Bruins are playing that badly, and they're still getting steamrolled. <laughs> that was not pretty. It was effective, and in less than a minute, Ducks put together three plays and score a touchdown. Well, they're going to get a great clear-out route here on this touchdown pass. It's going to isolate the true freshman, Josh Huff. He's at the top of the screen, number four. He's just going to run into the middle of the field. And there are absolutely no white jerseys. This is an easy read for Darren Thomas. And again, Craig, no pressure on the quarterback. You see Huff at the top of the screen right here. He's just going to run up, work his way in the middle. Zero presence from UCLA. That's very simple. You know, I was watching the offensive line and, and, and saw where they tried a little four-man crossing stunt up front. But again, this Oregon offensive line has given up only two sacks on the season, giving Thomas plenty of time to throw the football. And when you have someone as fast and as explosive as Josh Huff, he's going to find that hole and that void in the defense. You guys know how Chip Kelly told us he didn't like to waste time. He has shorter meetings, shorter practices, just wants to be efficient. Is uh, 22 points on 21 plays efficient? He had a string early in the season when they had scored a point a minute. Now they're doing a little better than a point a play. 22 to 3 early in the second quarter, and UCLA desperately needs a touchdown drive. Big pin. Not going to make it to the 20. And as the Bruins get set to go back on offense behind Richard Reho, time for tonight's weekend menu brought to you by Applebee's, the headliner on ABC, Oklahoma, going in to take on Missouri. I'm in Wisconsin down here playing against Iowa. John Clay became the first player in 30 games to have 100 yards against Ohio State's defense. Now he gets to turn around and play the seventh best rush defense of Iowa, with the best D-line in the country led by Adrian Claiborne. And how about LSU and Auburn? Cam Newton continuing his run for the Heisman Trophy, almost at 1,000 yards, only the second quarterback in SEC history to do that. Oklahoma State still sitting there as one of the ten undefeated teams in Nebraska needing to right the ship after the loss to Texas. Brio. Plays it in there. Nicely but unable to hang on. It's Christian Ramirez. You know what, Jesse? I, we saw the same thing. Guy up the sidelines like a receiver wide open. But the speed of Oregon's football team just too much. You couldn't, Brijo couldn't get his feet around to throw it. I want to go back to what you said because he did have a wide open guy down the sideline. They're not going to get a lot of wide open shots and open looks to try to keep up with this Oregon offense. Young quarterback's got to see it. He can't be afraid to pull the trigger. Second and ten facing Brijo. Bruins will keep it on the ground. Franklin gets nothing. It'll be third and long. In my evaluation here, though, watching this football game tonight, Oregon came in and wanted to show the country on Thursday night that they deserved the number one ranking in the polls. Chip Kelly always talks about them playing faceless opponents. They don't overvalue games against ranked opponents, and they don't overlook mediocre teams. They don't care if it's the New York Giants, the San Francisco Giants, or the Little Giants. They play at a certain standard week in, week out. The standard to be as good as he possibly can be. Pressure on Brijo. He gets it away to his back. Franklin got the first down and more. A good call by Norm Chow to keep UCLA from having to punt the football away. 
Well, they finally get an opportunity to show what they're going to do. You're going to see the hard press coming up in here by Matthews. You're going to see they're going to leave the middle of the field and now standing call by UCLA to take advantage of all of that speed that's been in their face. They left big-time pass rusher Kenny Rowe free. I think Rowe thought he had a sack. It was a great job by the running back just sneaking in behind him. Brio doing a nice job getting the ball out. That was a monster first down. A pickup of 18 on third and 10. That's a first down for the Bruins. Keep it on the ground, and suddenly not much running room there as Brandon Bear stuck him. Zach Clark was there to help. It looks to me defensively now, because UCLA has had some success running up the middle, these D linemen, they're not slanting anymore. They're playing their gap, putting their head down, charging forward. And the success they've had was when Christian Ramirez, the fullback, came in motion and added that extra body in there for blocking. When they pulled him back out and brought him out to the side, there's no extra blocker in there. There's no advantage for UCLA's pistol. Option. Riho left it. Another third and long. This is exactly where Oregon wants to put this UCLA offense. They come into the game averaging only 96 yards a game passing the football. Very difficult to convert third and long situations when you're not efficient throwing. And Oregon's defense has held the opponent to 30% on third down this season. Going with Richard Riho at quarterback in a pistol offense and not a very good offense on third down. That's a tough night for you. Bruins got 18 the last time. They were facing the third and 10. Three plays to go. Blitz coming. Pacinger. Rio got away from him, but he couldn't get away from the second defender. And chasing down was Michael Clay with a hit. Helped by a host of Ducks. Uh, and now they're going to come with pressure again on third down. You're going to see it coming from the inside right here. They're coming. They're going to try to get inside, and they do. They're just more bodies than they have the block, and Brijo is not quick enough to pull up and throw the ball to his hot route. So the Bruins are going to have to punt it away with Jeff Locke. Locke, fifth in the nation in punting, averaging better than 46 yards per punt. Left footer. That's the way one is going to drive Harris inside the 15. A little trickeration back to Josh Huff. But the Bruins, great discipline on the punt coverage team. And they're able to get there, and Dalton Hilliard was able to make the great play on Huff. That thing could have gone for a while. But UCLA there to cover it. Ducks have the ball when you come back. Well, I hope you're enjoying our broadcast in high definition, but if you have ESPN 3D, the Oregon-UCLA game tonight from here in Eugene being broadcast, spectacular 3D. See the guys working on the cameras and inside the 3D truck. One of the cameras and the announcers, Dave Lamont, Ray Bentley in there. Tim Brown also around along. So Tim's enjoying the offensive explosion. Have to wear the glasses, though. Checking it out in the press box before the game. Slant, Darren Thomas continues to be razor sharp. D.J. Davis making the grab. And this is why it's so difficult to get this Oregon offense off the field. They get chunks of yardage on first down to keep their second, third downs manageable. Thomas, a perfect 10 for 10. Ducks will run it. James cuts it back. This is where he's dangerous. <laughs> Tony Dye able to get a hold of him along with Andrew Abbott. The Ducks on the move again. There was 33 seconds on the play clock when they snapped that last ball. And they lost gap responsibility on the defense. What did Michael James do? Found the hole. James taking a break. Leaving right up the middle. No, it's a pitch. Great bait by Thomas. I thought he'd given it off. And Josh Huff, you better use him. Uh, I know. <laughs> you see, right now, I would have lost. I would have lost my assignment. If you lost your assignment going after the dive. They're the field. <laughs> and there goes Huff. <laughs> Oh, man, that, they what they're doing on first down, guys. Well, and, that, and that's the difference. Again, they just stay on the field. That is the critical down of your UCLA's defense tonight. Thomas keeps it. 
Takes a hit, completes it. He's 11 for 11. Jeff Mayles with another catch. It doesn't matter what they're doing. If it's zone read, if it's option, if it's play action pass downfield, everything working right now for Oregon. Just can't say enough about Chip Kelly and what he has done. Come, came completely off the radar to Oregon from New Hampshire as a coordinator and has put together a football team that is phenomenal. M&A Alston. Alston inside the 35. Another good pickup on first down for the Ducks. It was in 07, the last time they were ranked number two this high. They were at Arizona. Dennis Dixon, remember that, Art Reese? Mm -hmm. Yep. And they went in, Dennis gets hurt, you know, and, and yet they didn't have a quarterback. You know, all of a sudden, yes, they do have a quarterback, Jeremiah Masoli. Well, now Masoli's gone up there in Thomas. I mean, Chip Kelly just has a magical touch about offenses and quarterbacks. And if not for a couple of knee injuries during his career, Nate Pasta might well have had that quarterback job right after Dennis Dixon. He's the backup now. Thomas firing for the end zone, looking for Paulson, and maybe couldn't pull it in. First incomplete pass of the night for Darren Thomas. It really looks like on this drive, Oregon's able to take advantage of the youth and inexperience up front for UCLA. They got two freshmen playing defensive end. They're not staying in their gaps. They're not getting pressure on the quarterback. And now UCLA having more issues substituting defenders here on this drive. Ducks send a receiver off. Rare time the play clock is actually getting down to about 15. Just their second, third down of the night. Had one fourth down as well. Boy, Thomas took a hit. They're going to get a roughing the passer call. And that'll give Oregon the first down. Looks like Akeem Ayers, maybe Damian Holmes coming in to put a shot on Thomas. You know what? But they changed it up. UCLA finally tried to bring bodies to get to Thomas to disrupt his throw. But Ayers just got to hold up on that. And that's the second personal foul now. Defense, number 97. 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Second personal foul now since the kickoff on this drive, just setting Oregon up. You can't help them score points. They do that on their own. Trying to go hard and get some heat on the Oregon quarterback, and Holmes is a little overzealous. It's first and ten. Thomas gets hit again. He got hit again by Holmes. He's getting some pressure. One of the things Chip Kelly really likes about Darren Thomas, and he's shown his team several times when he shows the courageous play, he'll stand in and take a hit and deliver the football. He talks about his focus looking downfield. He's never worried about the bodies flying around him. He's not a very thick guy, only 212 pounds, but he can stay in there tough. Michael James. James still on his feet. Oh. And Raheem Moore continued to hustle and made the tackle for a loss. A remarkable run by James to stay upright. If not for Raheem Moore's ability to listen to his coach, Chuck Bullock, the defensive coordinator, said, bring your feet, keep running with your legs through these tackles, especially against LaMichael James, or you will miss. And that's an example of the sideline-to-sideline -side speed UCLA has on defense. The issue right now, they got to stay in their gaps. They need to get a stop on third. Thomas needs 15. Pressure coming. He takes another hit. Davis complete. Turns it north-south, trying to get to the first down marker, and it looks as if he's going to be about a yard short. Darren Thomas, at quarterback, already sprinting towards the line of scrimmage. There was no doubt they are going for this on fourth. They've converted a fourth down tonight. Ball snapped quickly. James, first down. The one thing that Oregon's offense does different than others on short yardage goal line, third and one, fourth and one, is that they snap it fast, right? That's so demoralizing oh. for a defense. That's the second time now on fourth down. Oregon spread it to the line and converted. And Chip Kelly saying, hurry up, hurry up, let's go. Thomas. Fire. Touchdown, Paulson.
Well, from the looks of things tonight, here at the Big O, it is duck season. Oregon laying a whipping in the first half on UCLA. Extra point about to make it 29 to 3. How about this number here? 21 out of 23 receptions by Paulson have been for a first down for a touchdown. You think that's a guy that just gets it done? He is the guy that the Oregon coaches will tell you have the best hands on the team. He had to go get a low one, and the Ducks are up by 26. All right, John, and that Oregon Duck who now has to do push-ups for every point scored. The Duck is now up to 73 push-ups tonight. And over 500 in the 72. Nothing went over New Mexico to open the season. And put together his own workout tape. <laughs> Rival all the P90X guys just do the Oregon offense duck push-up workout. <laughs> you want to you want to work out? Just be an Oregon Duck fan. Come to one of their games. There's so much excitement. Nobody's sitting down. Now Oregon scored every time they've had it. 29 to 3. The Bruins have just been overwhelmed. UCLA's done some good things in the first half tonight, but he's getting snowed under a yellow avalanche. Big Pen returning the kickoff, and he'll get about to the 26 yard line. Well, Saturday afternoon, catch a crucial game of the Big Ten. John Clay and the Badgers, number 13 in the land, taking on Ricky Stanzi and Iowa. Wisconsin coming off that huge win against Ohio State, going on the road to Kinnick Stadium. Others will see Nebraska and undefeated Oklahoma State. Some will see Georgia Tech and Clemson. 3.30 Eastern Time, 12.30 on the West Coast. College football presented by Buffalo Wild Wings on ABC or ESPN. Go to ESPN.com and search maps to find out where you can see the game you'd like to see. Kirk Herbstreit says that I was a top 10 team. Marty has them up there. This is their run. They begin to show why. Short game from Malcolm Jones, the freshman who just checked into the game. Iowa, Kirk had him number six on our BCS countdown show last week. And Iowa has the advantage of playing the meat of its games at home in terms of the Big Ten Conference starting with a game against Wisconsin. They've got Michigan State and Ohio State on the way, too. And I think Ricky Stans has really been the difference for Iowa early this year. Through six games last season, he might have been the most inconsistent starting quarterback in the country. But you see his numbers, he's been lights out. Season starts for him now, though. This is the beginning. Comeback, you better start soon for the Bruins. They're not really built to do it, but Brijo's going to try to get it started. Brijo finds Corey Harkey a short game. At least you're right. UCLA's done some good things in this football game. It's just that, that there's so much power and speed from Oregon. Did we? The University of Oregon, timeout number one. Timer set the clock to two minutes, 40 seconds. 30 second timeout. All right, so the short timeout as the Ducks try to get their <coughs> Ducks in a row, if you'll forgive me for that one. As you take a look at this week's projected BCS standings brought to you by Tostitos. And Oklahoma's sitting there. It's where, where we are right now. These are the initial BCS standings. Oklahoma's sitting at number one in Oregon right behind. I think the biggest thing, it was funny, looking at the, the BCS standings and in the larger version, you get to look at the computers, the discrepancy between the human polls and the computers, some of these standings, the human polls have Oregon, number one, both polls. The computers have them at number eight. On the flip side, Missouri, number 16 in both human polls. The number six in the computers, it's important to remember, the computers don't take margin of victory into consideration. LSU and Auburn this weekend, whoever wins that game is going to get a lot of props coming out of that win. Third down, Franklin needed to get to the 37. He's not going to get close. You know, on the subject of the computers, one thing I've learned from our BCS guru, Brad Edwards, over the years of following this, sometimes the computer rankings at this juncture of the season can be a little misleading. And as Brad said on our initial BCS countdown show, it's one of the reasons that the BCS for a while opposed releasing the standings this early because of the, the reaction you would get to something that didn't seem to quite mesh up with what people had seen on the field. 
Sunday nights, 8.15 on ESPN. I love that show because it's Santa Claus. When you reveal that, it's, it's like, interesting. I, I liken it to, I, I've always called college football the most significant regular season in sports. And to me, it's the most significant regular season meeting election night. You know, you sort of wait on those results and, and see who has the edge. But I'll tell you guys, I mean, I, I respect the computer rankings. I don't have a problem with them. I don't really need a computer or a poll to tell me this football team in yellow that we're watching is pretty good. <laughs> National championship worthy. Just to find my number one vote. It's Cliff Harris. He's going to, he muffed it. Cliff. Cliff couldn't handle it. And boy, he paid for it. Bruins still trying to bring some hits. There's Dalton Hilliard, who did a good job on the trick play on the return earlier, putting a hit on Harris. And then they're getting to know each other a little bit. Here are the top three in the BCS right now, where they stand in the three components. The two poles combined for two thirds of the formula. The computer averages uh, responsible for a third of the formula. Yeah, that, that, that seven there, Boise State on the computer average, and I think what's going to happen here as you start getting into conference play and those automatic qualifiers and the conference strength that they have is going to really prop up some of the schools that are below Boise State. Well, if you want to have an advantage somewhere, it would be in the polls as opposed to the computer, and that's where Oregon has advantage now there, and Thomas kept it. Thomas still on his feet. He's got a first down, and he'll dance out of bounds at the 45. The problem is, with UCLA going three and out, that gave the football back to Oregon with the two, over two and a half minutes left, which is just an eternity for this offense to score. That's like a minute and a half more than they needed. Yeah. And you saw Chip Kelly call timeout. Chip Kelly wants to execute. He wants to score. Hard, fast, finish. After the 22-yard run, Thomas threads the needle. Beautifully thrown ball to two and eight. Coming into this game, Darren Thomas struggled in a straight drop back passing game when he didn't have play action. But tonight, he's made some beautiful throws vertically downfield. You know what? This is such an improved quarterback from the spring when he was competing with Nate Costa. The confidence he has, he just looks like this is his football team. He knows where to go with the football. He's not making poor decisions. 22-yard run, a 22-yard pass. What does Thomas have in store? Mayo, first down. Jeff Mayo actually runs a double move stutter curl. I've never seen that run before. That was unbelievable. They scored a touchdown on this same move in the last game they played. And this time the pump fake, the defensive back stayed back. Touchdown coming here, boys. Oh, oh man. boy, here it goes. Your <laughs> Oh, what hands. <laughs> what a catch by David Paulson. I mean, what's going on? I, I feel like I just blinked, and all of a sudden, here's Oregon inside the 10-yard line. The tight end with the one-hand grab tucks yeah. it with the left hand. First and goal for the Ducks. The previous play is under further review. Now look, Thomas, I don't think he's frustrated so much, and, and Chip, too, and Chip getting the core loose. They're yeah. frustrated because it stops their tempo. Yeah, you run know, another play. And, and another part of the thing that's so impressive here with Thomas is he throws his tight end open. He threw the ball where he was, going to be open, a very difficult ball. It looks like at this point here, that's a catch. No question. And this review really works as a, a timeout and an advantage for a UCLA defense that's on their heels right now to try to get their win. But that thing, I'm going to go back to that double move. And here's a defense that has been coached up. They did a nice job. They realized it was a double move. It was a fake hard pump by the quarterback. And instead of the receiver continuing on his route, he breaks it off. And Thomas knew exactly what was going to be done by Jeff Mayo. You know, this UCLA defense gave up 304 rushing yards two weeks ago against Cal. And a lot of the players questioned their own intensity in that football game. I don't think the intensity has been the problem tonight for UCLA. They're just getting out schemed, and they're just simply getting beat. Assuming this pass and catch stands, Aaron Thomas tonight, 16 of 18, 220 yards and two scores. A lot of people questioned whether or not he should have been the starter this year. After further review, the ruling on the field stands. Oregon ball, first down and goal. 
Uh, you know, again, here, it, it, there's no indisputable video evidence to tr overturn the call on the field. Jesse, I, I did the spring game out here. Nate Costa, and he's a good player. Yeah, no, a good player. I, absolutely. And they were both competing, and they were just neck and neck, and, and Chip decided to go with Darren Thomas. But, I mean, Costa's a good player. Yeah. Bruins have been torched on pass defense previously a spring. Thomas in zone and complete. UCLA tried to change it up that time. They tried to bring the blitz, and this Oregon offensive line that's given up two sacks on the season picks them up. They're just not letting them get to Thomas. They're giving up a sack once every 89 pass attempts. You'd like that, wouldn't Think you? about that. I love that. You kidding me? <laughs> Great offense to play in. Michael James, one of the few Oregon plays tonight that hasn't worked. Crowd reacting as Cassius Mars sort of put the finishing touch on the Michael. Now patting him on the back. Hey, hey look, you know, when the whistle stops, you want to, or sounds, you want to stop playing. But the way he breaks tackles, you better get him on the ground. Yeah, you know what? You can't really fault the guy, can you, Reese? No. For having an extra effort, it's hard to, hard to get a guy down like this. For Michael James. Cassius Marsh, the true freshman defensive tackle. Last thing you want to do is get LaMichael James very upset. I think I, if you're UCLA, you're hoping to go back to the Reese Davis board. <laughs> hey, it was a first down inside the 10, mister. <laughs> Thomas thrown to the end zone. You see what happened? They went to the Burger King board that time. Steve Sloan applying the pressure. You know, I believe College Game Day is uh, working on a feature that they're going to run at some point on the unique... Did uh, you ever signaling think, system that uh, Oregon has. Did you ever think growing up that you'd be on, on at an Oregon football game, you'd be on their board? No, no. I, can, I can assure you that I never imagined it. And that's a win for UCLA's defense, guys. Oh, yeah. as, as weird as it is to say that, letting them march down the field here in two minutes, that's a, that's a win. A field goal against this offense is a win. First stop. Bob Beard puts it up, puts it through, and with that... As Chip Kelly arrived as offensive coordinator in 2007, this the most points Oregon has ever scored against UCLA since that span, 2007, 32 to 3. Now is the lead. Sitting first and second in the chase standings, Jimmy Johnson and Denny Hamlin head to historic Martinsville Speedway, where they've combined to win the last eight races. Stakes are higher now. They try to continue their mastery of the track. Their pursuit of a Sprint Cup title to chase for the NASCAR Sprint Cup continues at Martinsville. Sunday, 1 o'clock Eastern on ESPN. As you see where they stand, Johnson going for five in a row. Hamlin within 41 points. Harvick and Gordon still with a puncher's chance. And the Ducks going to have to push out some more. 32 more. I think the Duck realizes this could be a big night. He's going halfsies on the push-up. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure the tail feather is sinking quite as, as low as you'd like either. Getting a little surf action in 42 seconds left. Now, here at UCLA, I've got to think you have nothing to lose. But you really don't want to go in. You, you don't want to turn it over. I mean, this is a difficult situation of what to do offensively when the Bruins get it back. I, t I tell what's interesting about this game is we're observing one heck of a powerful football team to see how much that damage they can do. Big Ten on the return for UCLA. Damian doesn't quite make it to the 25. Now, Michael James, this is a Thursday night stage for him in terms of uh, getting some Heisman voters on his side. Well, and this offense has had tremendous balance so far in this first half, and they've been very wise to get their best player offensively involved, both running the football and catching the football. And he's only 23 yards away from having another 100-yard game, which would give him 14 on his career, tying Jonathan Stewart in a brief career. How much success this guy has had is just remarkable. Top six all-time rushers and certainly on his way to a Heisman worthy, at least a Heisman contending season. Bruins will keep it on the ground with Jonathan Franklin. Well, and that just proves to you how much confidence UCLA and their coaching staff have throwing the football right now. Really nothing to lose. Two timeouts remaining. Well, they try do. to throw the football, get back in. Well, they do call the timeout. You know, kind of to go back to the 
Heisman discussion. I was talking with Joe Tessitore earlier today, and Joe does the Heismanology segment where he tracks the ESPN Heisman voters, and he was talking about how Michael James slipped a little bit just because he didn't play last Saturday, and the great game that Cam Newton had against Arkansas sort of vaulted him to the top of, of virtually all of the Heisman voters that Joe has been tracking. I think the reason Cam Newton is at the top of that list, at least in my opinion, I would argue he's been more critical and crucial to his offensive success and his team's overall success than any of the other guys on that list. And, and he's not just a running quarterback. Arkansas blitzed him last week. And so what happens when Arkansas blitz Cam Newton, 8 for 9, 132 yards, and a touchdown pass? So you can say, yeah, take away the run, and you got Ar Auburn beat. Not so fast on that. Yeah, it's been tough to take away the run from him. I think the most effective thing that Cam has done this year is get seven when they need third and six, get five when they have third and four. And even when you have a play defense perfectly, as Oregon did behind Casey Matthews that time, even when you have Auburn defense perfectly on a third down situation, it's tough to get that big fella on the ground. He finds a way to get the first down and make another play. Heisman Trophy winners have big moments in big games, and in Cam Newton's two biggest games against South Carolina and against Arkansas, he had at least 175 rushing yards and three touchdowns. And now Mississippi State, a top 25 team, another nice notch on Auburn's belt in, a, in the game where we did, and we saw kind of the coming out party there that night with Cam Newton. And, and I think the most important thing he's done to from a from a, a team building standpoint is the other guys are starting to feed off of him now. I mean Auburn's won a lot of close games. The game we saw is a three-point win. The Clemson in overtime, South Carolina in a little bit of a close game. And now you mentioned the big stages he's had. He's got two more coming against LSU starting Saturday, Alabama later. But this will be a big one on Saturday on the plane. I'll ask both of you guys. You grew up down in the Southeastern Conference. You played in the SEC. Have you ever seen a guy have this strong a start with this big a statement? at the quarterback position in the SEC. Maybe Tim Tebow the year he won in 2007, but this will be the best test Cam Newton has faced so far. This LSU defense is serious. They are fast. They are physical. Statistically the best defense in the SEC. Yet another test, another chance for Cam Newton to show those voters. Yeah, we'll see. You know, we'll see if LSU can take advantage of that pass defense that's sorely lacking at Auburn. They've already allowed 13 touchdown passes against them. And, you know, at one time, Darren Thomas, the quarterback here from Oregon, was committed to play at LSU, wanted to play quarterback. And one of the reasons he decided to change his mind to come to Oregon was because LSU had in mind uh, perhaps that Darren would change positions. Now, you know, Jesse, as you pointed out, he's a fit for this particular offense. Every situation is different. But uh, one time, Thomas was on track to go to Baton Rouge. But he's doing awfully well here in Eugene tonight. He has his team up 32-3. Jim Brown with Rick Newhouse. Coach, you've had some success early moving the ball. What do you need to do in the second half to convert on those drives? Well, we got to find a way to stop them. They, we haven't yet. They've been down the field every time. Uh, the last time, Reese held them to a field goal, but they've been uh, dynamic tonight on offense. What's the one thing you want to see out of your defense coming into the second we're gonna, half? Then? We're going to keep fighting, Jen. We're going to we're going to go down there. We're going to dial up some offense. We're going to see if we can get ourselves back into this game. We will not quit. All right, thanks, Coach. All right, Jen and New Heisel's dealing with a very young team, some inexperience on defense, and having to deal with this offense and that running back. That's not the way to go. 32-3 at the break. Let's join John Saunders, the IBM halftime report. Welcome back to College Football Primetime on ESPN, served by Applebee's. Impressive does not do it justice in UCLA to their never-ending credit is actually returning to the field for the second half after Oregon dropped 32 on them in the first half, 32-3, ducked on top of the Bruins. Total domination statistically by Oregon, the nation's number one scoring and offense in terms of yardage, 357 yards in the first half. Reese Davis, Greg James, Jesse Palmer, Jen Brown down on the field, and, you know, Reasonable minds could differ about who really number one is, but Oregon certainly made its case in the first half. The most impressive thing for me was 16 of 20, 220 yards by Darren Thomas. And they did not get to Thomas. Again, this offense has given up two sacks all season. If you can't stop the pass, that run's going to just crush you. It's, it's great balance. The impressive thing to me for Oregon has been their ability to handle the big stage. Everybody wondered how this team would respond now having the targets on their back number two in the BCS, number one in the human polls, and they're out here putting on an offensive clinic.
Second half is underway. Josh Huff returning the kickoff. Huff's got great speed. And he's tripped up just across the 30 as we take a look at our coaching adjustment brought to you by the Home Depot. Well, if you're wanting to get in the coaching business, go ahead and go to Home Depot and find this offense right here. This is going to be called give and take. You give it this time to LaMichael James. The next time you take it from him because that's what the read told you to do. That's what this offense does. It takes what the defense gives them. And then, again, when Thomas can throw the ball like that, Jesse, that, how, do you, how do you think about stopping it? Guys, this has to be the first time that our coaching adjustment has been don't make an adjustment. Yeah. Just keep doing what you're doing. Huff on the pitch. Another first down big game that moves the chains immediately for the Ducks. Raheem Moore and Steve Sloan on the stop. Josh Huff is one of only three true freshmen that have even seen the field this year for Oregon. He's averaging over 15 yards every time he touches the football. you got to be special to get on the field your first year out of high school. He's one of those guys. On this team. Yeah. James with his first carry of the second half. And LaMichael gets it down to the 45-yard line as we check in with Jen Brown. You guys are just talking about no adjustments from Kelly, but actually I talked to him coming out of the half, and he says, believe this, they're actually holding the ball longer than he would like. He thinks Thomas needs to get the ball out quicker, so uh, that's his adjustment coming out of the half. Jen, Jesse mentioned he'd been able to go to his second or third read. Rolling to his left, another completion. Now 17 of 21. Lavachier two and eight. The coverage was by Raheem Moore. This is easily the best I've ever seen Darren Thomas throw the football. Whether it's been in the pocket, whether he's getting on the perimeter. I wonder what the Lee Corso play is. The Lee Corso, Carl the groundskeeper combination play. That, I would say with Carl the groundskeeper, it has to be explosive. Lucky they're not going against Minnesota when Carl the groundskeeper shows up. He did not have an affinity with Gophers. <laughs> well, this UCLA football team would like to find a groundskeeper. They, they'd like to find someone with a, a photograph they could borrow to stop Oregon's mm -hmm. offense. I mean, when you look at what they've done, 21 of those 42 plays. And they just get it going. They don't let you breathe. And Kelly won't be satisfied. I mean, you cannot count the number of times he screams tempo at practice. Thomas, got him in. Paulson couldn't hold it. And David Paulson with those great hands has made some fine catches tonight. Couldn't hold that one in. And there's just no pressure on Thomas. And this ball, the throw, what a fantastic. David Paulson got away with a one-handed catch earlier in the game. That's one he needs to get two hands up to secure the catch. Can't get cocky. Did the guy not have his arm holding it down a little bit? Looks as if he could have. This is the only thing the Ducks didn't do in the first half, convert a third down. Oh, well, so much for that. Now they've done that, too. On the previous play, the pass play, the defensive line just stayed their ground. They did not rush. That time they said, let's go rush him. They lost containment. Oh, there he is. Reese Davis back up. RD, pressure's on you, buddy. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, you know what? Chip Kelly said, if pressure is when what you feel when you don't know what you're doing. Well, I see your wife infiltrated Oregon. They've got War Eagle. <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> he was throwing to Paulson on the side, and it was almost intercepted by Tony Dodd. This is one of the first times we've seen UCLA able to get pressure directly into Darren Thomas's face. He does a nice job staying in the pocket, trying to deliver the football downfield, throws it behind Paulson a little bit, almost picked. That, All right. was, that was the Reese Davis play, by the way, almost picked. <laughs> you wait, I'll get you back. Michael James. Getting inside the 20, it'll bring up third down for the Ducks. I'm sure Rick Neuheisel went in at halftime. You heard him tell Jen right before he left the field, we will not quit. And, and, and Rick had a focus about him and a seriousness coming into this game. He knew he was playing a great football team. You could feel it. You could see it. He's looking for effort from his football team. Thomas on third down is complete. Davis has it. Pushed out of bounds, which is if he'll have enough for the first down. 
I wonder what Neuheisel told us. They played Oregon very tough the last two times they played. He thought they matched up. He thought they were motivated to come in here tonight. I don't think he anticipated this game getting out of hand like it has so far. James. Inside the five. I talked to Rick on the field before the game, and, and he said, we're here to play. We're we're ready. It sounds like one of those coaches' cliches, but this is a team that has some ability, but it's also a team that has a lot of experience in the front seven, inexperience, I should say, in the front seven on defense. The offensive line's been rebuilt. They're using a new offensive system. I'm not trying to make excuses for it. But that's real. That's yeah. not an excuse. That's reality. Yeah. They're going against the juggernaut right now. Thomas. Enzo. Touchdown. Jeff Mayo. Bill Evers again. Twenty of twenty-six, two fifty-six, and three touchdowns. Well, Michael James is a deserving Heisman candidate on this Oregon team, but Darren Thomas is stealing the show. A uh, beard on for the extra point. And the Ducks have 39 on the board. Duck, I'm going to tell you the chest muscle is going to be sore from all the push ups. UCLA sore from getting steamrolled. Third touchdown pass of the night from Darren Thomas. Men in yellow are rolling. <laughs> Rain is starting to fall in Hudson Stadium. It is falling just about as quickly as the Ducks are scoring points. 39 to 3. Oregon has scored on all six possessions tonight. Five touchdowns and a field goal. Five touchdowns by five different players. And the Bruins trying to get it back. Damian Thigpen returning to kickoff. Now the Ducks are swarming on special teams. Let's check in with John Saunders back in the studio. Well, we should time now for the AT&T All-America Player of the Week. He's from Oklahoma State. Justin Blackman, receiver, 10 receptions for 207 yards and a touchdown and a win against Texas Tech. Got 955 yards in the season and 12 touchdowns. Remember, text the word VOTE to 345-345 to vote and for a chance to win a trip to the National Championship race. John Blackman has to be the leading contender for the Bolitnikov right now. Brijo's first pass in the second half is complete to Marbury. There's another great example on that touchdown by Darren Thomas getting through his progression. He's going to roll out to the left. He's got a slot receiver, two and a running a return route, but the second read is Jeff Mail working the baseline. He gets through it very quickly, makes a very accurate throw, rolling to his left. Now, why did that play work? Two and eight, the slot receiver stayed his ground. He didn't drift to the middle of the field. Had he drifted to the middle of the field, it would have been right in the passing lane. Jonathan Franklin is drilled. Josh Cadu sticking his face in the fan. You know, but that's the precision of this Oregon football team. It's offense, defense, special teams. But just the fact, like that Q&A, doing his job, and if it's there, they'll throw it to you, and if it's not, don't get in somebody else's passing lane. Very well coached up. Everybody on the same page. Five touchdowns by five different players tonight for Oregon. Third down and four, and if the Bruins can't pick this up, they're going to have to deal with that duck offense again. Here comes some pressure. Bruins pick it up nicely. Brio trying to run for the first down. Richard staying on his feet and fighting his way across the 30. It'll be first down for UCLA. And that's what Rick Neuheisel's looking for, especially from his quarterback, Preho, getting out of the pocket, making a play, extending the series. Rick Neuheisel said he's looking for his quarterbacks this year to have consistency, leadership, and management. And after starter Kevin Prince had struggled throughout most of the first half, he's told his quarterbacks it's a competition, and it's open. Richard Preho trying to make a statement, try to strangle and take hold of that job. 
Prince injured, not dressing tonight. He's had a knee problem for much of the season. It's cost him a lot of practice time. Brijo avoids a couple of duck rushes, but mm -hmm. can't avoid Spencer Paysinger. You know what that does, Jesse, as a player? If you know the competition's open and Brijo's out there and he's got his chance, it's good. It, 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 it's contagious for the whole team. It makes both guys work harder. I'd say the one thing I'm seeing tonight from Richard Brijo, you can see he's not as dialed in with pass protection. There's been a lot of black helmets running out of the three. He hasn't been looking at hot or sight adjustment throws. He's learning as he goes. He's inexperienced. He's getting this experience first hand tonight. Yeah, to look at Prince on the sidelines. I said he wasn't dressed. It's what we've been told, but he is not going to play tonight with that knee at all. Franklin bursts into the secondary. First down for the Bruins up to midfield. Well, just got this one off, and it's all, it's kind of awkward when it takes the play clock down to one second in this ball game. But that's the right call he made that time, Jesse, at the line of scrimmage to get him in that play. That's one thing Richard Brio was telling us. Playing quarterback in the pistol offense, unlike in the West Coast offense, you have to make a check and a decision every single play. Not just throwing the football, but in the running game as well. It forces you to be sharp every single snap. Ten, Coleman's back in. Rijo has to get rid of it. Heaves it up. There's a flag flying. Taylor Embry was out there. Jerry Johnson was also out there. They threw it from the direction of where Johnson was coming into the pattern, short of Embry. Pass interference on the defense, number 13. 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Cliff Harris is a guy that has a lot of upside, and they're trying to work right now. Nick Aliotti, the defensive coordinator, just to teach him the little things of the game. You know, getting the hands on a receiver down the field right in front of a, an official, you're probably going to get called on that. Yeah. But, you know, Harris is a guy who has enormous talent. He took two punts back against New Mexico to tie a... Pac-10 record that has stood since Mike Garrett played for USC in 1965, the former Heisman Trophy winner. But Harris is the guy who has that cornerback attitude. He's the guy that Eliotti has a great deal of regard for. He's trying to help him develop and Nick's words conform as Brijo goes up top, throwing for the end zone. He can't connect with Jerry Johnson. There's another flag on the field. Offside on the defense, number 58, five-yard penalty, still first down. It was Kenny Rowe, who led the Pac-10 in sacks last year, called for the offsides. I want to go back to Harris for a minute. Uh, Harris has four interceptions already this season, a second in the nation, but he's really just now earning his first start. He, he's got that attitude and the confidence you like when he showed up here. Now, I'm going to paraphrase because there still might be some kids up someplace. He introduced himself to his teammates by saying, I'm Cliff Harris, and I'm here to lock Expletive. stuff. Well, I was going to say stuff. <laughs> down. And so he's had to sort of conform with the system, but he's a guy that they're very high on, and Eliotti really thinks he can be a tremendous player in this tough defense. Kenny Rowe, after being called for being offside, got in the backfield rather quickly that time. Last year, Nick Aliotti, his project guy, was Eddie Pleasant. And Pleasant was a linebacker, very emotional guy, that he taught him how to be a football player. Now we're in, in Pleasant now is so good, they moved him to Rover, which opened up another linebacker spot for two other good players. Well, Nick Aliotti will, will tell you, he's a bit of a dinosaur in the sense that he wants his players to conform. He wants them not to be me guys. He wants them to be we guys. Until Cliff Harris does more of that, he won't play as often. And he thinks that Harris is moving in that direction. Rijo right. throwing on second down. Short completion. Right on the coverage there is the aforementioned Cliff Harris. Nick Aliotti and his defense, they, they really don't get all the praise they should. But on third down, for instance, the money down. 
that's where you really see when a defensive coach is lined up with his players and his players understand his strategy and philosophy of the down and distance. Well, and he's showing you his experience as a play caller, taking advantage of the young and experienced quarterback, sending lots of pressure on this down, try to force a bad throw or get a sack on only a sophomore. That's 11th in the country, as you saw a moment ago, on third down. Now they'll try to keep the Bruins from getting two yards. Franklin, first hole wasn't there. He didn't have anywhere to go. Josh Cadu makes the stop. They bring a strong safety blitz on this particular third down. It ends up working well because up front they're able to stymie those linemen from UCLA and it doesn't allow the running back a place to get away. It, especially to the outside, Jesse. It, it doesn't allow that cut to get outside because that pressure's coming off the corner. And they really did it with balance. You're seeing a very effective defense staying in their foxhole. Ty Forbath is going to try a field goal. He is only six field goals short of the NCAA record. Ty from about 49, easily within his range and, well, within his accuracy. Two Forbath field goals tonight. He's five away from the record. The Bruins still down 33. These are the great facilities here at the University of Oregon. Certainly a uh, man who has made a great deal of that possible is Phil Knight. Of course, the head of Nike and a, an Oregon graduate, former track athlete here. Great fan of the Ducks here at Austin Stadium tonight. His favorite team, though I'm sure with his position as a businessman, he has many favorite teams. The one where he went to undergrad with a 39-3 lead on UCLA. Josh Huff will return the kickoff. Up gets it out close to the 30-yard line. And we're starting to get used to this script. Number one ascends to the top, and then they have to go deal with a tough-ranked opponent on the road. This week, it'll be DeMarco Murray in Oklahoma venturing into Blaine Gabbert's house in Columbia to take on Missouri. ABC Saturday Night Football, 8 Eastern, presented by Southwest Airlines. You see a comparison between the two quarterbacks. Landry Jones a bit of a dark horse for the Heisman Trophy right now. He went 30 of 34 against the Iowa State last week broke the school record for completion percentage in a game with a minimum of 25 attempts. Here's the numbers that jumps out at me in that ball game. Oklahoma on third and one or two, 89% conversion. They keep the ball. Michael James loses his footing as he is close to the line of scrimmage. He'll lose a couple. Which allows Landry Jones and DeMarco Murray in that offense just to keep it and grind it. Oklahoma, powerful team. I mean, it's and they're young. They're just going to get better. Thomas up top, Mail's out there, Mail's got it. Yeah, you know, if we could show you replays with this offense, we would show you UCLA's defense running around as the ball's being snapped. They're not lined up. And if you can't get lined up, you got no chance to play defense. Thomas needs two yards for a 300 yard passing game. This is the nation's third leading rushing attack. He's got it. 300 yards, Mail on the catch. How about Jeff Mail, a guy that played safety his first 10 games as a freshman for Oregon? They moved him to wide receiver, and he's been Mr. Consistent the last three years now catching the football. He put on weight so that he could become a better player, a stronger player. He's dependable. I really like Mail. Oh, it's batted down from Thomas. Mail. When he was 12 years old, Thomas his dad was on a fishing trip and he told him he couldn't play football. He slipped around and tricked his mom into letting him play. And uh, his dad was a good player back in his day, but his dad, Steve, has been battling multiple sclerosis for the last few years. And parents often make the five-and-a-half-hour drive from Paradise, California, to come up and see Jeff play. And he's put on a great show for them tonight. But Michael James. There is a flag on the play at the line of scrimmage, and with the incredulous look from Thomas, this is probably coming back. That's a play where UCLA just guessed wrong on defense. They brought pressure from the short side of the field. That opened up Offside, a huge gap. On the defense, number 11, penalty declined. 
First down and goal. Well, Darren was over there looking at the official like, what did we do? And the answer was nothing. It was on UCLA. And I, I'm just so impressed with this offense at the tempo they run without making as many mistakes as we've seen from other high-paced offenses. It's the problem with these gap offenses, right? They just zone block. They let the running back find the hole. 14 now career 100-yard games. Already tied the school record just, just in his 17th game. Did you see that? You see who made the tackle? Darren Thomas. That's about the only guy there who can tackle <laughs> Michael <laughs> Slay. You guys down. <laughs> Footsie. Uh, well, Michael over 100 yards again. He's getting close to 1,000 on the season. Came in with 848 yards, and it's after missing the season opener due to a suspension and off the field incident. This is very rare. This is the slowest we've seen Oregon get ready for a snap so far this game. Thomas. It's hit right in the face. Ball is banded around and goes incomplete. It was Steve Sloan applying pressure. Courtney Viney was on the coverage. It's one thing that's got to be very frustrating for UCLA tonight is the lack of pressure on Darren Thomas. They're averaging three sacks a game. That was really one of the strengths of this unit heading into tonight. But they haven't been able to get it done. Yeah, and again, going against this offensive line that's given up two sacks on the season, you know, you were trying to see which one was going to be better. And clearly, Oregon's pace far better than the pressure of UCLA. Now, you've got freshman defensive ends in UCLA. They've uh, been a little confused by the speed tonight. This guy can confuse you. But Michael heads for the pylon. He'll be stopped just short of it. It'll be fourth down. Oh, he's he's right. <laughs> oh man, that move right there. Putting the leg up in the hole, bringing it right back out, getting everybody sucked in there, and then he picks it up full speed immediately. And how about this killer mentality by Chip Kelly up 39 to 6, and they're going to go for it on fourth down. Well, you know, Jess, I, I think if you kick a field goal here, that's running up the score. I mean, you know, you might as well just run the play. You don't really need the points, just work on the play. Thomas can throw it, a flag comes down. The, Pass is incomplete, but there is a flag sitting just outside the 10-yard line. Holy, number 42 on the offense, penalties declined, first down. So to your point, Reese, you're saying basically there, there's a chance they won't put points on right. the board. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's a tough situation because I mean, Chip Kelly, he does have the aggressive mentality to finish games, and we're still in the third quarter. You know, there's nothing, you know, nothing untoward going on. But what are you going to do? You kick the field goal, you put three up, you don't need, you score a touchdown. It's more as it stands. The Bruins finally get a stop, and they'll get the ball back. This telecast available in 3D on ESPN 3D, brought to you by Sony. See some of the fans at the Bud Light viewing party in Eugene experiencing the very latest technology firsthand. You'll probably see that duck offense just coming through the screen at you. you put 39 on the board. They're up 39-6 on UCLA. Bruins with their first defensive stop of the night. Holding Oregon on fourth down, but now... Mr. Brijo and the offense will put it in play. Their own three. Brijo throws it out of his own end zone. And he's got his man. It's complete to Randall Carroll. Be a first down. You know, New Eisel has been working a little bit shorthanded for various reasons for the UCLA offense. Couple of guys not in the lineup tonight. Josh Smith and Morrell Presley both serving a one-game suspension. Officially for a violation of team rules, though multiple reports have said that the two flunked a drug test, which would be their third and per UCLA policy, would sit out one game. Now, while Neuheisel certainly didn't confirm the exact reason why, he said the worst repercussion you could have is to have somebody sit out a game. And he said what they had to do is Rio was throwing it down the middle looking for Anthony Barr is that you have to take games away and hope that they come back and play hard and play tough as we go back to the studio and check in with John Tarn. Three Sports Center right now brought to you by Keystone Lights. It's the top of the third. Phillies down one nothing already. Shane Victorino grounds the first. Aubrey Huff boots the ball, allows two runs to come in, and the Phillies grab a 2-1 to -one lead. So on to the bottom of the ninth, up 4-2 with two out. Brad Lidge struck out Ishikawa. 
and there will be a game six. Sports Center will have full details. Back to you, Bruce. All right, John Derek Coleman being swarmed under. You saw the National League Championship Series, the American League Championship Series, of particular interest to UCLA tight end Corey Harkey. His dad, Mike, is the bullpen coach for the New York Yankees. Did they try to rally against the Texas Rangers. They're going to figure out a way to hit that Rangers pitching consistently. That's been an interesting run for the Rangers. As indeed, Josh Hamilton is showing his immense talent. There is Corey. He's an athletic family. He's chosen football and he's junior. Has four catches on the season and none tonight, but he's helped the Bruins run it a little bit at times. Reels holds it too long. Ball's on the ground. Looks like the Ducks have it. Kenny Rowe got to Richard Brijo, and Oregon's on the doorstep. Young and experienced quarterback Richard Brijo showing you that inexperience here. Understanding when you're down inside your near your own end, third down, ball's got to come out. And if, if your first receiver's not open right away, you immediately got to look for a check down, or you got to throw this football away. Yeah, but just to tell you how much of a work in progress UCLA is. At left tackle, 72, Sean Scheller was playing defense in 09. Mm -hmm. So they're they're trying to put the parts together to where they all can have success on plays. There are just a lot of a lot of guys in new positions they've never played. There are three guys that aren't on the UCLA offensive line. Xavier Suofilo is on a Mormon mission. And Michael James goes in for a touchdown. Another academic ineligibility and another with an injury. Guys, it could have been starters up front for UCLA. Kevin Prince is starting quarterbacks out, and Oregon is now rolling it up as Michael James winning again. Go ahead and give you a plan of seat for you to ponder as we go through the end of this ball game. Who would you like to see this Oregon team line up and play against in the country? But wherever it is, you better think of somebody that's got speed on defense and can play in space. <laughs> The extra point is up and good, 46 to 6. Oregon offensively happy to take advantage of a sudden change situation. Another simple zone read play. The offensive line doing a great job opening up a scene for LaMichael James on yet another score. You take a look at the rush chart and kind of where he's been able to run with success. He's really had a lot everywhere. <laughs> yeah, because he's nine. He averages nine to the left side. He <laughs> eight or so to the right. That's just. And you know, I was watching that time. Carson York, big number 77, left guard. I mean, they just crush people once they get on you. That big offensive line. They six foot five. Big fellas. You know, we asked Chip Kelly who his best offensive lineman was, and he didn't really single anybody out. He said they're kind of, they played to some of their parts. And then all five guys played last year, all five returned this season. They have that chemistry, that continuity. Maybe the biggest reason why this offense is able to roll. Well, this offense is sitting at 500 yards on the dot for the night, and we are not yet through the third quarter. That's about 67 yards short for their nation-leading average. Bruce Davis, Greg James, Jesse Palmer, and Jen Brown with you, seeing an impressive display from the number one team in the polls, number two in the BCS, UCLA playing for pride. The Ducks have pushed their lead to 40. Damian Thigpen's been busy returning kickoffs tonight. He stopped at the 23. Speaking of fast, hard, and finish, that's what the NASCAR guys are going to do. Sitting first and second in the chase standing, Jimmy Johnson and Denny Hamlin head to historic Martinsville Speedway. The two have combined them in the last eight races there. Stakes are high right now. Try to continue their mastery of the place as they pursue a Sprint Cup title. Those two guys sitting in first and second. Johnson going for that fifth straight crown. Hamlin 41 points back. Race from Martinsville, Sunday, 1 Eastern on ESPN. Getting late in the third quarter, UCLA has it back. Rio throws it out of bounds. You know, the Pac-10 today announced the new divisions that will come when Colorado and Utah join the conference next year. 
And not that this will be the indication every year, but probably say the UCLA is probably glad that they are not in Oregon's division because they're not going to play the Ducks every year. And I know it'll be different. I just wish this could have happened a little earlier and not had to show up here tonight. Uh, I, look, I look forward to watching Utah play in the Pac-12 and see how they handle it. It'll be interesting to see the, the effect this has on recruiting kids from Southern California. If you're playing in that North Division, you don't get a game in Southern California every year. You're going to play one of those teams once every every other year. It'll be interesting to see how that affects it. Brijo throwing for Marv Ray, catches in a flag, it's flying. You know, guys, I talked to Larry Scott about the uh, interdivisional scheduling. The one thing that will happen for the schools in the Pacific Northwest, and it, it had been a stumbling block, they wanted to play the teams from Southern California every year as we get the call on the penalty here for the rest. Pass interference on the offense, number 82, blocking down 15 yard penalty, still second down. And it's just not going well for Taylor Embry and UCLA. It's Pass interference is going to push the Bruins back. But the one thing that is going to happen when the Pac-10 becomes the Pac-12 division play going to the conference championship game, you'll get a game against one of the schools from Southern California if you're Oregon, Oregon State, Washington, Washington State. You just won't necessarily go there. One of the schools will come here and play and, and play against the teams up here. I think that I, it caught my attention was the fact that whoever has the best conference record will host the championship game, not a neutral site. I like that. I think that rewards and encourages you to get after it during the conference record. The division champion with the best conference record. What happens all of a sudden if you have an Oregon team that's 11 and 1 and a USC team that's 11 and 1? Then where does the game go? You continue to bicker. You know, I, I asked Larry that too, and he said it would probably wind up looking at the BCS standing. That would probably be who would get the home field advantage in that case. Larry Scott being the commissioner. Right, the commissioner of the Pac 10 who has really shepherded in a change. And CLA continuing to fight. With Larry Scott back in the summer who was very aggressive in terms of expansion going after Texas, Texas A&M, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State trying to expand to 16 teams, but still. They've expanded their footprint, We've got a conference championship game now, and really as, as the landscape and uh, the structure of college athletics changed, the Pac-10, the Pac now the Pac-12, the soon to be Pac-12, sort of gotten a step ahead. i tell you what, Colorado and Utah adding them, I think that's a real plus, a very strong, solid conference, continues to get better. Rio needs 15. Arkey makes the grab. He'll be well short of the first down. And we go inside 10 seconds remaining here in the third quarter. All ducks all the time. Darren Thomas has had a huge night. Fourth quarter coming from Eugene. Stadium in Eugene, number two in the BCS standings, number one in the polls. Oregon, a 46-6. Their duck has done a lot of push-ups tonight, getting himself ready to work out with Craig and Jesse. What in the world are the boys up to tonight for a workout? <laughs> You'll be able to see momentarily. <laughs> what are you stiff arming me, man? I, 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 I thought you were going to jump. I barely hold the duck. <laughs> Come on. I was looking for a little love and a ride. <laughs> UCLA having punted away on fourth down. Cliff Harris. Harris not much on the return, and here's what you guys had in store from the Oregon strength and conditioning guy. And, and you know what, Jesse, I don't know, I think we agree. This warm-up exercise is, I was sore this morning. It really, it stretches you out pretty good. And they do a lot of speed work here. They had these speed ladders. This, this crushed me. This, this absolutely worked out. My stabilizers on my shoulders, which was awesome. Chop, 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 chop. Yeah. <laughs> so they do a lot Look of work. Look at the footwork, oh, the pace, and, the and, great and pace. Moving, and moving the sled. Look at the core. Oh, man. Well, Duck's still working on that latest set of push-ups, 46. And it looks as if Darren Thomas's night is over as Nate Costa has checked in at quarterback. Nate getting some heat and runs away from it. 
to go back to the to the workout we did, the strength staff here at Oregon focus a lot on speed work and eliminating false steps that slow people down. The word fast and speed uh, are, are used very, very frequently here at Oregon. And they're talking about power, getting feet up, putting them down. One thing for certain, these Oregon football players, they know where their feet are. Costa leaves it with Remine Alston. Alston inside the 40. Still on his feet. Remine inside the 20-yard line as the Ducks are on the move again. Now, this is just a loaded football team with the depth. Early in the first quarter, Alston comes in, got a carry or two, but you see that the fresh legs and the offensive line still getting out there. Big number seven, he had him a block there. Ransom Gopalson. Costa. Nate Costa driving inside the five, and the quarterback who aspires to be a secret service agent trying to punch one in. Especially on what you just said, Craig, teams that will compete for the national championship this season will have to be deep. And they have a lot of depth on offense, really at every position. Nate Costa is a guy that proved himself two weeks ago in a win against Washington State. They have it at every spot. They got two quarterbacks that can win. Alston looking for the end zone touchdown. Fifty two to six. This is the 64th meeting between Oregon and UCLA previously. Biggest margin of victory for the Ducks against the Bruins. 27-0 back in 1929. They're going to set a new record here. No, oh, that's not going to be received well by the crowd because I'm going to wonder what's the point. Well, I tell you the point that I that I take away from that series there was this second group that's in there, the second quarterback. He's the ball's across oh, yeah. before yeah. anything is that they scored in a minute and five seconds. That's not actually slowing down anything, is it? <laughs> Coming no. into the game, they had 18 of their 36 touchdown drives happen in five plays or less. That one just happened in four. Like you said, Craig, that's with the backups in. And UCLA still has their starters in. 29 plays over 25 yards coming into this game. They just have it. And because of the pace that they go through in practice, their conditioning level, their off-season work, strength and conditioning coaches, just, they're, just, they're just a good team. After further review, the ruling on the field is confirmed. Play results on a touchdown. Remine Alston, his second touchdown carry of the night. Alston getting more playing time as Kenyon Barner sits out. Yet another weapon that the Ducks didn't even have to unveil tonight. Barner was injured in the Washington State game and took a blow to the head and was carried off in an ambulance and has been wearing earplugs to try to help that equilibrium along as he continues his recovery. The Ducks been able just to send the next guy out there and 53 more push-ups coming but what hand variety just to make it a little more difficult i guess oregon easy time up tonight up 53 six well fanny whipping like the football bruins are taking never happened to lou al sender now kareem abdul jabbar the great ucla center for john wooden teams back in the late 60s kareem a friend of rick neuheisel's flew up with the uh, Bruins team for the game tonight. That was hoping for better days as the second ranked Ducks about 53 to 6. Bruins about to get the football back. Maybe in big band. Stopped short of the 25 yard line. Well, Saturday afternoon, catch a crucial game in the Big Ten. Wisconsin and Iowa did the Badgers follow up after knocking off Ohio State last week. Iowa's got everybody coming to them down the stretch as they try to win the Big Ten. Nebraska and undefeated Oklahoma State. What a matchup between Blackman and Prince Andrew Kamara, the fine defensive back, or maybe Alfonso Denner, the other cornerback in Nebraska. Great individual matchup. Some will see Georgia Tech and Clemson. Saturday, 3.30 Eastern, college football on ABC or ESPN. You can go to ESPN.com, search maps, 
Find out where the game is that you want to see. Duck being passed around. Bruins going to Malcolm Jones for a short game. You know, I think a lot of people wonder why UCLA moved to the pistol offense earlier this year. And Norm Chow and Rick Neuheisel are two great offensive minds in terms of conventional offense. But two years ago, they were 116th in the country running the football. Last year, they were 92nd in the country running the football. Something had to be done. So they went up to Nevada twice this past offseason, met with Nevada head coach Chris Hall, and decided this was the offense they were going to implement to find greater success on the ground. But they lost something along the way. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. That certainly worked with the unintended consequences and the detrimental effect they saved for spending so much time putting in the pistol and the option version of it. The film goes nowhere. That it's really hurt their passing game in terms of timing and in terms of being able to work on it. As you see, the great improvement they have made on the ground using this pistol offense. Yeah, but that passing at 95 yards again, there's not enough balance there. And with Norm Chow and Rick Neuheisel's background with coaching quarterbacks, with Rick playing the position, they will figure it out. They'll get there. I think, in my opinion, in watching all this, you have to have a mindset, first of all, that you want to be successful throwing as a player. Then it's up to the wide receivers at UCLA to pick it up. They've got to help their quarterbacks in running better routes and getting open. Rio has some protection. Throws in. Taylor Embry. Good route, good catch. And the Bruins will pick up a first down. One of the things this offense was able to work on during the bye week was their timing between quarterbacks and wide receivers. And last year, this offense spent a lot of time with the quarterback under center. This year, they're in the shotgun. It's different footwork. It's different timing. But there's a great example yeah. of being on the same page. Well, how about Embry? Here's a guy, 93 career receptions coming into the ball game that has the ability to do it. You saw him continue to drive, knowing he's going to get hit. Go ahead and catch the football. That play put the Bruins over 100 yards passing, which exceeds their average for the season. Let's check in with Jim Brown down on the side. Just some news on Kevin Prince. We've been finding out down here from the UCLA staff that he will undergo arthroscopic surgery on his knee on Saturday. There's no timetable for his return, but they're really just trying to figure out why it's continuing to slow out and why it's giving him so much pain. So it's not good news for the Bruins and Prince tonight. No, Jen, it's not. Kevin, of course, engineered the upset of Texas and Austin. And Rio's a good athlete, but Prince is probably a little bit better runner, a little bit more suited for his pistol-style attack. And the offense may continue to evolve. They, Rick said, wants to always be able to throw and catch, and they just haven't done it effectively this season. Rio does have a completion to the freshman Malcolm Jones out of the backfield. Well, here's a great opportunity then for this UCLA offense to get better. If you know Tyler Brijo is going to be your guy here going through conference play, start lining up in five wide receivers like we just saw there, give him some looks, help his confidence so you throw the football better down the stretch. You know who we saw last year in the Holiday Bowl do that mindset, open it up and let it go? Sean Watson, Nebraska. Yeah. You know what? They said, let's just get after it. We're going to open it up. We're going to do things. And uh, sure enough, once you start doing it, you start feeling better about it and having some success with it, and you go to it. Rio, another completion. This one to Anthony Barr. Barr gets down to the 30. Another first down for the Bruins. The coaching staff did not expect them to be so one-dimensional this season. They thought they would have more production throwing the football this year. Here's a job of Rio understanding where his hot receiver is, getting the football out quick, and allowing him to go make a play downfield. Something he had not been doing earlier in the game. Already you're seeing improvement from Richard Brijo. And Brijo's only completed 50% on the season. That was coming into tonight. And it was 14 out of 18. Jones is stopped immediately. I don't want to, I guess I, I guess because I'm standing next to you, Reese, I've got the watering on the parade deal going here. But <laughs> he's throwing the ball better, but it, it, Oregon's defense back is up. definitely, you know, what they've, they've taken a step back from what they were bringing in the first three quarters. They'll get their younger guys in, yeah. too, as yeah. they should. At this point. Keep yeah. in mind, Oregon has not given up a point during the fourth quarter all season long. So, 
there's anything to look for a positive if you're UCLA. They've given up only 104 points all season. That probably amplifies USC's passing woes better than anything. The 130 yards is a season high. Last year, in a different offense, Kevin Prince had three consecutive 300-yard games. Three hole has to get rid of it and throws it over the head of his intended receiver, Christian Ramirez. Taylor Hart, the freshman, was applying pressure. You know, and on the topic of the pistol offense, I really think head coach Rick Neuheisel has to make a big decision this offseason. Does he stick with this style of offense and begin recruiting a different type of quarterback, or does he take keep parts of the pistol offense and try to go back to playing under center in a more West Coast style of offense? Chris Salt uses it, uses it at Nevada. It's worked for him. Colin Kaepernick does his thing with it. In the Pac-10, I just don't see it, man. I, I, I think you've got to be able to, I know you've got to be able to throw the football in this conference. Rio in trouble, and he has to throw it away. It'll be fourth down and ten. What you've seen a lot of teams, guys, around the country do, and you see a lot of teams using a little bit of the pistol. And, and honestly, from talking to Rick in the offseason and just thinking of what UCLA has been historically, I think that's more what we expected to see, a little smattering of the pistol to help the running game. And the fact that you've got Norm Chow as your quarterback coach, right, you, and, and who's been with great players, brought him back from the NFL. I mean, you should be able to go get a premier quarterback to come in here and play quarterback at UCLA. Oh, Nick Aliotti there in the middle. He doesn't want to give any more fourth quarter points up. He wants to keep that goose egg there. Haven't given up any yet this season in the final stanza. Oregon up huge. Can they keep the Bruins off the board in the fourth? Call it the House of Loud. And Oregon up 53-6. And still the fans are into it, trying to help stop UCLA on fourth and ten. Richard Brijo throwing. It's incomplete. And the Ducks got to stop. Frustrating night for the Bruins. No touchdowns, only a couple of field goals. 53-6, Oregon's up. <laughs> Oregon putting the boot to UCLA's throat. 53-6 in the fourth quarter. Ducks have it back after stopping UCLA on a fourth and ten. The Washington has been a little rainy in the second half of this game. A Costa in a quarterback for Oregon. He completes his class out in the flat. That's Daryl Hawkins making the grab. You know, guys, last night, uh, Chip Kelly invited us to come by his team meeting uh, at the hotel the night before. We got a chance to really see how Chip, just in his second year as a head coach, interacts with his guys. And there's some guys that really know how to captivate their players in a room and get their message across and he had unique and uh, and clever ways of getting messages across to his team. Here's a run from Austin. I was into it. I mean, you know, we haven't been, we don't get to a lot of team meetings, but Kelly did have the attention of his players. And he starts talking about, you know, this, this not giving up and being focused in, in a boxing match. And this is the seventh round of a heavyweight fight. And he put a video on of a ninth round major fight, boxing match, of two guys just pounding each other. It was Mickey Irish Ward, Mickey Ward and Arturo Gotti who had three epic fights. Uh, and one of those fights really was a candidate for fight of the century. And he had that ninth round on. He talked about the season being a 12 round fight. And call from the penalty, the last play. After the play, there are two personal fouls. 43 on the defense, number 70 on the offense, penalties uh, offset, down will be two. When you're watching the ninth round of this war between Mickey Ward and Arturo Gatti, I mean, it is just that. It is a slugfest, drag-out battle. And he comes back up when the video's over and he starts talking about Irish Mickey Ward, grew up 20 minutes away from him back in Massachusetts, and then he says, you know what, I can't tell the story that well. Let's get Mickey up here to tell it himself. Three doors down from us, Irish Mickey Ward gets up, goes to the front of the class, starts talking to the team. Hawkins on the quick catch, and Ward's message was one that really echoes and amplifies what Chip Kelly always talks about, about being relentless, 
never giving up, no matter how many times you're hit, just refuse to go down. And they they had the visual, they had the they had the videotape of the ninth round of that fight against Gotti with those two guys just wailing on each other, and everybody was into it. And and the players really received the message. It was a, a creative way to to kind of capture the imagination of your player. Ward told them to keep their chin down. <laughs> Everybody's going to be coming after you as your number one. And if the guy's telling you like that to keep your chin down, I think stay on it. He, he, I, just the power of what he presented. When you look at him, I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm sitting there looking at this guy, how impressive he was in that fight, and he exemplifies courage and heart. Mickey Ward kept saying, you got to play smart. You got to play with heart. Lowell, Massachusetts. Here is the first punt of the night for Oregon. They have certainly played with heart. They played smart tonight. One of the more remarkable things, you know, a lot of assistant coaches, one of their assistants, as Chip Kelly was for a long time, they keep a notebook. Hunt gets away. And they write down things they'd like to do when they're head coach, but a lot of guys have a little more trouble implementing them. Chip Kelly seems to have been born and built for a job just like this. He's about to go to 17-3 and three in his second year with the Ducks. He's up 53-6. to six. We need to cheer him out for Oregon tonight. Number one in the polls, number two in the BCS, and looking every bit the part, 53 to 6. For Michael James, early night of it, impressive, nearly going. Good Duck fans a little bit of a scare early when he was hit close to the goal line and helped off the field. But Oregon is 1.3 points behind its national leading average, and they've now surpassed their yardage total in terms of average. Came into the night averaging about 567 yards per game, 584, and the Bruins have a false start. Bottom of the screen. False start on the offense, number 10, five yard penalty, still first down. That's the freshman Ricky Marbray that Greg Neuheisel's really high on him. Marbray, a talented receiver that Neuheisel really appreciates. His effort and work ethic, he said he comes to practice every day as if it's the Super Bowl. Marbury played fairly well tonight. He came into the night with 12 catches, a couple of touchdowns. The Bruins have tried to find a little bit of balance in the passing game to go with their running attack, but not much has gone right think, tonight. Think back on the first quarter, Reese. They came out running the ball effectively, but again, no points in the first quarter. I mean, they've got 14 all C. I I mean, they, they just can't score early and they get behind. Well, this is what the Ducks have lying ahead of them now after they finish off this one against UCLA. Three difficult road trips here, here, and here. And keep in mind, USC will be coming off a bye week at home. Remember, Oregon put up a lot of points against them last year. USC will be looking for revenge in that game. I think the Trojans are really starting to hit it on offense. Oh, yeah. They're, They're a few plays away from being undefeated. Oh. Two plays, really. Yeah, They've lost late drives against uh, Jake Locker in Washington, a late drive by Andrew Luck in Stanford. That's the only thing that, keeping them from being perfect. That's it. I mean, and Matt Barkley is, is a precise, great quarterback. He's thrown 20 touchdown passes and only four picks. When was the last time a USC quarterback had those numbers and he wasn't in the Heisman race? I know USC's lost twice. Yeah. But Matt Barkley's playing out of his mind. He is, and that defense is young. They will get better. Monty Kiffin, their D coordinator, he'll get them going before this season's over. Very dangerous team. And, and obviously the probation's a factor too because USC not a factor in the national championship race because of that and eligible for the postseason. And that certainly played into the fact that maybe Barclay's freehold just gets smashed from behind. It's picked up. It's going to be a fumble. It is Marvin Johnson who's trying to get in the end zone. It's Brandon Hanna who knocked it loose and the Ducks have a chance to get to 60. Now, this is just the backside. Now, we have seen this several times tonight. Richard Brijo just not getting rid of the football. That internal clock, not inside him, not ticking tonight. That's Brandon Hanna, the backup left defensive end. We talked about the depth they have on offense. They got a lot of that on defense as well. And because they rotate up to 24 guys a game, they're able to stay fresh. They're coming right at you as fast as they were in the first quarter. They're bringing it in the fourth quarter. Uh, Brijo tried to tell that his arm was going forward. Every play in college football review, so they've had a look at it. Not the case. Ducks keeping on the ground. Walston diving for the pylon. 
No signal. Yeah, it looked like a touchdown. And now they give it to him. Remine Alston going into the end zone for the third time tonight. You talk about athletic ability for Austin to be able to put his foot in the ground, running the curve on the outside and extend the body in the ball. Chip Kelly having a coaching moment right now with Remini Austin. He gets him over to the sideline, starts pointing at the replay, and he says, hey, you had a lane to run through in the middle. Why would you bounce that outside? Never missing an opportunity to coach one of his players. Yeah, coach, but what happened? Is it six? <laughs> That's what you would have said, coach. It's in the house. Well, I would tell you, the, the coaching point might also be take care of the football on first down because that was very close to a touchback, too. <laughs> you, see, you see Chip Kelly kind of looking at him. Hey, you know, where are you going on that? You know, we're trying to run that thing inside. Why would you bounce it outside? And, but he's patting him on the yeah. back, too. And, you know, and, 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 point. and here's another point that he's doing. He's trying to tell his team, you know, I know you're good. He's going to have great challenges coming up, making sure he can keep his team focused and on task for the season. He will not allow this team to lose its focus. Reese, we had a chance to watch practice yesterday. Mm -hmm. He tries to distract his team during practice. They play crowd music. They play music on the speakers. They have video going on, the Jumbotron to try and, and distract his team, but you look at this right here. Oh, That's pretty there. good. They've uh -huh. only punted one time tonight. And they got stuffed on a fourth down right. in the third quarter deep in uh, UCLA territory. But I mean, look at that. That's focus right there. And Guy's able to dial in. Look at the yards and the time, the scoring drives. I mean, for them to go two and a half minutes on the scoring drives a long time. You guys have mentioned earlier, Chip likes to refer to it as having a faceless opponent. As you see, the dejected face of Richard Grijo. And what he encouraged his guys to do in the meeting where we were last night was not to worry about playing well enough to beat somebody, but to play to your standard. Try to be as excellent as you could possibly be to do, to do as well as you can, regardless of who the opponent is. And I would say that the that the Ducks have certainly at least come close to that goal tonight. So is this guy here. You talk about play regardless of the opponent. I thought the 16 for 20 in the first half, the passing, the success, two touchdown passes early. Thomas just never got rattled and showed incredible composure. I think we've, I mean, we've now seen a quarterback. This is his team. I did not think Darren Thomas was a good passer when he didn't have play action. He had really struggled this season when he was forced to drop back and make a throw downfield into coverage. We well, changed my opinion tonight. Deadly accurate, getting through his progressions, keeping plays alive. It's the best I've ever seen him look. Well, he is tonight's Wrangler five-star player of the game and well-deserved with a career-high 308 yards passing. Brijo's pass complete to Corey Harkey for a short game. And I, and, I, and I tell you what else he did well. Not only did he throw it well, he has to make decisions when he's running the football. That zone read and when to give it, when to take it, how to make calls at the line of scrimmage. Again, Chip Kelly has taken his quarterback and he's taught him football and how to run his offense. Well, boys, wonder if something's going to happen this weekend in college football on Saturday. Uh, they were looking for the number one in the polls to go down for the third straight week. Not happening here. You, you think Brett Bielema's maybe calling some guys up, telling them how to do it? Yeah, maybe so. But, uh, you know, I think the biggest challenge for Wisconsin now is trying to avoid the fate of South Carolina. Oh, hey, only three penalties a game. Uh, Wisconsin's got it going. They'll have a little confidence coming off that. Going to take on Iowa and Kinnick Stadium on Saturday. And certainly... Um, Iowa, a much different challenge than South Carolina had going in against Kentucky, but Gamecock blew a big lead, couldn't finish the deal. See how Wisconsin, how much gas they have left in the tank when they go to Iowa. I'm curious to see a Nebraska team on the road at Oklahoma State where they haven't won since 1995. Brandon Whedon, second best in the country in terms of passing yards per game. There's Malcolm Jones. Ridden out of bounds at about the 30-yard line. That Nebraska defense is the best pass defense in the country. We had a chance a few weeks ago to watch them. Quarterbacks only completing 47% of their passes against the Black Shirts, and that's an angry Nebraska team after getting beat at home by Texas. I'm kind of excited, game. I'm calling Saturday Georgia Tech at Clemson. Big ACC contest. Contest. We did that game last year on a Thursday night. Their first one. We saw a very good football game. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing 
Georgia Tech take it on the road. Austin football on the ground. This is if the Bruins fell on it. You know, every week in the studio, Lou Holtz likes to say it's a different team every week, and, and I don't think anything could uh, embody that more than some of the results we've seen. For instance, that Georgia Tech team that you're going to see Saturday somehow lost to Kansas. <laughs> That's the same thing Paul Johnson is continuing to wake up at night thinking about. Yeah. This team beat Texas, who beat Nebraska. And, uh, I mean, how did... and then turned around and got beat by Cal 35-7. Right. We got smoked by Nevada. Right. Well, That's why I ask you guys the question, what's going to happen Saturday? That's you, right. You, you never beauty, know. It's the beauty of college football. Riho gets rid of it. Has a man wide open. Ducks make the tackle inside the 10. It's Randall Carroll. It's significant now with under two and a half minutes to go. We'll see if the Oregon reserves on defense can rise up and keep UCLA from scoring the first point of the season against Oregon in the fourth quarter. Only allowed 16 points in the second half. Eliotti, who was really dialed in for this game, and Craig, you said you thought he was as, not tight, but as intense as you've seen him before a game. His defense has played great. See if he can keep that little statistical nugget alive. Brijo. Richard Brijo into the end zone. Touchdown Bruins. That is a great sign if you're Rick Neuheisel. You see a young quarterback, Richard Brijo. He's going to be your guy now for the next few weeks, continuing to fight and continuing to compete when he's had some struggles early in this game. You know who I, I saw doing their thing out there? That offensive line. They are fighting as well up there. Sean Scheller, left tackle. He's had a couple guys run by him tonight. Comes down, seals the inside, and allows Grijo to get in the end zone. Well, UCLA is still trying to get its program going in terms of attracting talent. A lot of freshmen and sophomores, particularly at the skill positions, and get a touchdown on the board against Eliotti's defense. Saturday night football on ABC, number one in the BCS standings. Oklahoma taking on Missouri. Two of the ten remaining undefeated teams in college football. Saturday night football presented by Southwest Airlines. ABC at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. Here's DeMarco Murray. Oklahoma's won seven in a row against Missouri, including back-to-back -back Big 12 championship games two and three seasons ago. This is one a lot of people are, are wanting to find out. Who is Missouri? How good is Missouri? Who have they played yet? We're going to find that out, Greg. I, I agree, absolutely. You know, and then the undefeated teams that are in the country that are remaining there, I can't wait to see LSU and Auburn. What a great football game that's going to be. And how about Michigan State? Off the radar for a little bit. Now Kirk Cousins, that offense, that balance of that defense, they are a good football team. They're going outside the state of Michigan for a game for the first time this season on Saturday when they go to Evanston to take on Northwestern. Now, you know, it's not a walk in the park for them to go down to Ann Arbor. It's not far away, but it's a tough road game. They won that, but it's first time outside the state. Tricky game for Michigan State. Don't look past the Northwestern team that's only lost once because they got Michigan State's got a big game on the road at Iowa in two weeks. You can't look past Northwestern. And the computers will look at Northwestern as a good football team. That, that's a good win for Michigan State, should Sparty pull it off. Yeah, you know, Dan Persa, the quarterback, you know, side kick is unsuccessful for UCLA. The Ducks will have it. The quarterback for Northwestern, Dan Persa, is in the top five in the country in both passing efficiency and total offense. Uh, under Pat Fitzgerald, they'll always present some problems. They seem to find a way to score. Now, Michigan State, He's played them pretty well the last couple of years, and some other teams haven't, but I, I agree with you. I think it's a tricky game and a tricky spot in the schedule. Pretty good team, better than advertised. So it's be tough for Michigan State. Another one of those games that supports the, the concept that these automatic qualifier conferences really have to gear it up and play every week, every Saturday. Guys, I was curious tonight to see how Oregon could handle the target being number one in the human polls, number two in the BCS, the national stage. You know, Chip Kelly's attitude about playing faceless opponents, never talking about rankings, uh, has been very impressive. You know, he's a guy that, that, that earlier said, look, we're the defending Pac-10 champion, so it's not like we weren't going to get everybody's best effort anyway. Yeah. You know what else I noticed on this thing today, too? 
this offense is so powerful, it blows up the opponents and their thinking, their mindset. The offense on the other side of the field center thinking, hey, we got to go tit for tat with this thing, and it's just going to be hard to do it. Well, in just a minute, a little more than that, of game time, we'll take you up to Sports Center. That's the sign for Scott Van Pelt is going to read the highlight for the Oregon UCLA game, I'm sure. Which, what, what do you like better? Which one? Producer. Photo, top left, bottom left. <laughs> I know, I, I know why you like the I know why you like bottom left. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Scott. <laughs> there it is, top left, bottom left. <laughs> I'm, a fan of the bottom, I'm a fan of the bottom left also. Uh, Oh, uh, what's wrong with Gusto? Nobody's giving Gusto any luck. Visited with Scott on his radio show today. Big fan of college football. Loves the sport with a great passion. We always get a kick out of hearing Scotty do the highlights on Thursday nights after our game. We'll see Sports Center coming up in a minute. Somebody should tell me who's anchoring Sports Center with Scott so I don't, it's not just, you know, all the praise for one anchor, not the other one. As 14 seconds away, Oregon has finished off UCLA. 60 to 13. Time winds down. And the Ducks remain undefeated, 7 0 for just the third time ever. And Jen Brown is with the head duck, Chip Kelly. Hey, Coach. <laughs> hey, Coach. Big game from Darren Thomas tonight. What did you like about your quarterback's play? Just his boys didn't turn the ball over. Exactly what we asked him to do. We knew we were going to have to throw the ball a little bit because of how tough they were on the run defense, and he did a great job. You had five different guys score on offense. What does that say about your versatility we're of your team? Balanced. We're pretty balanced, and, and then we got a lot of different guys besides the Michael James, who I think is one of the best in the country. So, you know, it's it's another one on us. We got a couple days to rest, but we have a huge game coming up. Defensively, you were able to shut them down and hold them to just 13 points. How were you able to do that tonight? You know, I, I, I think our defense is the unsung hero of this football team. They've kept us in every game. They play really well. Um, and as the game goes along, because we play so many guys on defense, we can wear people down. You talk about looking ahead. You've got a dangerous USC team next coming off of a bye week. What do you expect from that game? We expect everything. You know, I, I, I've got so much respect for them. I think Matt Barkley is one of the top quarterbacks in the country. Uh, they've got a lot of weapons. they got a young receiver in Woods who's outstanding. they got great running back. You know, we think it's going to be another tough back down battle, and we've got to play on the road, which is really hard in this league. Thanks so much, Coach. Breeze, back to you. All right, Jen, and the challenge that Alabama found in Columbia, and Ohio State found in Madison, this Oregon team might very well find in Los Angeles next week, but not tonight. Team from Los Angeles, no match for number two Oregon, 60 to 13, the final. Sports Center is coming up next. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For Craig James, Jesse Palmer, Jen Brown, and our entire excellent Thursday night ESPN crew, I'm Reese Davis saying good night from Austin Stadium, the Ducks 7-0.